and in the room with me today I have Alex Eason, Andy Allen, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong and Robin Newton and I have no members as yet who have come in on Starleaf but that's okay, we'll, hopefully they'll join us shortly. So I'll move straight along then into item one which is apologies and this morning we have an apology from Fran McCann and Carol McKillen and then um, and I'd just like to say welcome Carol I suppose back to the committee as well it's great to have her back um, and we'll hopefully uh, wish Fra and Carol uh, a Merry Christmas and we'll see them in the new year. I'll move on then to agenda item two which is a ministerial briefing. Members you'll find this briefing paper at page 30 of your pack and then can we welcome um, the minister Deidre Hargay um, to the meeting today and uh, she has she come on in the start has she been in the spotlight? Minister, are you there? Somebody's there? I don't know if it's the Minister. Minister, can you hear us? Now we'll maybe have to have a look at that. There's Jacqueline is on, we can see her. Jacqueline, can you hear us? Thank you. Okay, we're just thank you. thank you. We're just then waiting on the minister. Um, okay, members. Then just for time, because you know we're always pressed for time. Um, I think that we could maybe make a wee start then on the chairperson's business. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take you then to um, item number four on your packs, which is chairperson's business. Um, just members, you'll know that we plan to continue to start meetings early in the new year to accommodate extra briefings. And can I propose that the meetings start at 9.15 to accommodate as many members as possible being, pre or being pregnant, being present. <laughs> yeah, where'd that come from? Being oh, present well. at the start of the meeting, because I know, and I think it's, this is where it came from. Um, I know some of our members have to do school runs and things like that. So if members in agreement then, can we then go to 9.15 start? Is yes. that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, members, also then, just to say to you, last Friday, Movie House Cinemas invited me along because we have two of them in North Belfast. We have one in Glengormley and one in Cityside. And invited me along just to have a look at what they'd done um, over COVID for, for opening again, which was fantastic. But while I was there, they, they started to talk about a few other issues. Now, you'll see it. It's in your, your um, <coughs> notes there as well or in your correspondence pack. So it is, and they'd mentioned about the, the licensing bill and also about um, applying for the, the, the grant through the Arts Council for the large for the organisations and how difficult that was. So would members be, I just want members' agreement um, if they would be minded to invite the Movie House representatives along to brief the committee in the new year? Yeah. Right. Yeah? Because it's one of the sectors that we haven't heard from, yeah. and um, they, they, they're, they've felt very left out of many things because of a lot of the, the direction. They weren't, they weren't given a lot of direction during the many of the lockdowns. Um, I'll just check if the minister's with us yet, is she? No, still not there. Okay, then, members, another thing, I had met with Advice NI yesterday as well, again, to do with the North Belfast issue, and the issue around safeguarding and vulnerable welfare clients was discussed in the, maybe the fact the conversations with some of you here in the room as well. And it was just to, um, just to say that I know Sean Holland, Chief Social Worker, is working on the safeguarding bill to bring through to the Health Committee. Um, so it's just whenever that time comes, would they, just to ask the members, would they be minded then that the committee then um, do a submission to that bill when it comes to the whole issue of safeguarding and universal credit? Uh, Kelly, you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say, when you read through Marie Kavanagh's report, she mentions it as well. So it would be worthwhile um, maybe for us to even ask in advance of that what safeguarding measures are in place by the department for those people going into homes, um, just to see if, if we can, you know know at least in advance what what is in place nope, that's fine that's okay so members just i just want to put while it was in my head i put it in my chair's brief just to, yeah, to say that idea. to members um so i've just been told here that the minister is trying to get into the meeting so she's there now she's on the phone all in three second oh okay well i'll just go to agenda item five we can do it quickly which is the draft minutes you'll find those at page six of your meeting pack, our members content to agree the draft minutes of the 10th of December 2020 as drafted. Agreed. 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 Good stuff. Okay, um, so do we have the minister with us now? Just trying to call in. Just call in there. 
just for because I could move on to matters arising, but it's rather longer. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to move on? Minister's just trying to dial in, so if you move on, we'll be just move on. Okay. Uh, if we then could go to agenda item six, which is matters arising. Um, members have been provided at page eighteen and nineteen with replies from the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Economy on the High Street voucher scheme. Um, the, corris- uh, the correspondence from the Minister of Economy highlights that charity shops will be included in one of the bricks and mortar businesses where a prepaid card, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, can be used. Um, so uh, just that members then content to note that and maybe send that on to the charities then, that that response to let them know that, that they are going to be included. Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Chair, just when I was reading through this, um, absolutely that the charity the charity shops, but it just it sprung to mind. We don't yet have the detail of the High Street Voucher Scheme. Um, within benefits, we have a system where, um, in order to protect families, you know, where the, there's the, the benefit can be paid to... The husband or wife or, and that sort of thing. I'm just actually wondering if we could write to the minister just to ask her um, if she could talk to communities about some protection like that with that voucher scheme because we don't want a situation where a voucher goes to a household and the intention is to spend it to re-engage the local economy but the benefit isn't actually going to the family, it's maybe misused or somebody else takes it away. I'm just wondering if there's something that we could ask the minister to consider um, putting those protections like communities have in place. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good point. So, yeah, we can write back to the economy minister and ask that. Robin? Uh, Chair, I just wondered if indeed uh, a more effective uh, communication might be perhaps a press statement on behalf of the committee via yourself on this uh, agreement. Just get it straight out. There. Get it out straight into the media yeah. Yeah. Um, for the charities to be made aware and for people to be made aware mm. that actually they, they can such, such a disparate. Uh, so we do know that, that those charity shops, and we know we I certainly have some in my area that don't have that facility to pay with cards, yeah. so that yeah. that's going to pose a problem. But we can't do anything about that. That's yeah. no, just, well, as long as we make them aware. Yeah. Sure. No. Okay, Robin. Thank you. I'm going to ask again if the minister has joined us. No. Stalin. Second. All right, okay, and I see uh, Mark Durkin has joined us, so Mark, you're very welcome as well to the meeting. Good morning. Good morning, Mark. We're just moving on because the Minister is getting just a few issues and dialing in here, so we're on matters arising, (coughs) agenda item six at the moment. Um, So then I will move then on to uh, page 21 of your memo then. There's a, uh, a me- or sorry, of your meeting packs, there's a memo from the Justice Committee seeking views on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Um, members, have they any comments um, uh, uh, to write to the main stakeholders for their views on the bill before drafting a response? No, all okay with that? Right, then we then will move on again then to page 22 of your pack. Um, there's a letter from the Minister in relation to phase two of the COVID-19 Charities Fund. Um, members have also been provided with a copy of a written statement at page 26, which outlines the criteria of the fund, which includes information on the issues of charity reserves. Um, so the Minister has said that those uh, res- reserves on the whole should not uh, adversely affect those groups in applying. Um, however, there's still a need to ensure that funding achieves maximum impact by supporting as many charities as possible, and this therefore places a restriction on replenishing reserves to the level of the charities' reserves policy. Now, I note on that um, she hasn't uh, directed any comment towards the issue of those charities that are still waiting for their Northern Ireland registration. So, can I just then ask members, would you be happy then that we write back again to the Minister and highlight that issue and again ask? Um, why this, why, why that uh, wasn't a, a, the clause or whatever it was was not enacted in 2008, and why those charities are still um, being disproportionately affected by that. Mm-hmm. So members happy enough with that? Kelly, you wanted to come in. I was actually um, on page 23. I'm a wee bit concerned about the funding cap, um, and it brought to mind um, this money has to be spent within this financial year. And I'm I'm concerned that there's a barrier to spending then for charities because I'm sure there's plenty who can put away the seventy five thousand maximum um, as quickly as they possibly could. But if this is, I, I'm just concerned that there will be a restriction on the amount that can be applied for if they have to spend it by the end of March. I would like to ask the the um, department for clarity. Is it that it leaves their bank account? 
and goes to the charity, and then the charity can you know spend it on the projects and, and the, the things that it's been awarded for if it happens to go beyond the 31st of March, or is it a case that the charities have to have every single penny spent by that date? Because I, having worked in the charity sector, they will kill themselves to get this done. But let's be realistic here. If we have another lockdown in January, how is this going to affect that? And we do need them to have that money. Oh, absolutely, Andy. Uh, my recollection was officials, did officials not confirm that was it last week or the week before that, this, that that money was not directly linked to programmes? Well, this is this is the thing here. They seem to be saying mm. that it does need to be um, um, spent. So I'm, I'm just it's it's because well, it's we can we can just write for clarification on it. Yeah. So we can. No, that's fair enough. We can do that. Um, okay. Then yeah. again, I'm going to ask: Has the minister joined us? Any sign of that, Oliver or Sean? No. Okay. We'll move then. Uh, still on 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 this part of the brief anyway. So can I ask the members then to move to page twenty seven? where you'll find a departmental reply to the committee queries on funding for the community transport sector. Um, and I've lost my place. Any comments, members, on that? Chair, I'll need to declare an interest. I know it's a while ago now, but I used to be the Northern Ireland Director for Community Transport Association. OK, look, thank you for declaring that. Any other comments on that? Are you just content to note that? Okay. Um, Chair, what I, will say, what I will say is councils don't really provide an awful lot of money to community transport. It's through the Department of Infrastructure. Um, so I'm just wondering if we should be in contact with um, the Department for Infrastructure um, to ask them for an update on what's happening with these charities. OK, then we'll do that. All right, thank you. Then, uh, then um, <coughs> members, you've also been required, uh, provided with a draft letter to the Museums Northern Ireland asking for more information on its rationale to remove the Model Engineer Society from the control site uh, is in your tabled papers. If you want to take a look at it, it goes in. It, it, it's more than that. It asks a, a lot more questions than that. Members, again, we said last week we'd bring this back for agreement before we send it off. So have members had a look at it? Have they any comment on it? Are they content that we issue that letter? Um, yeah, content. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Fair um, enough. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to ask again: Is there any sign of the minister? No, because I can't move on to the next agenda item. So I'm going to then fire members. If we can go further along in our packs, and we could maybe then. Have we got any? Do, do, do. We've got. Just bear with me, members. The I try and we've got an SL one. That our next. But we have um, oh. a departmental briefing on that. Oh, have we? Yeah. yeah. And SRs we can take. Do the one on the heating payment that we can't take. We can't do yeah. the heating payment. Yeah. The heating payment one. Which number is it? Sorry, tell me the number and then I can find it. You can do that. So we can do ten. We can't do eleven. We can do 12 and 13. Okay, yes. then, uh, members, then can I take you then to agenda item 10? Then we have an assembly research paper on High Street Task Force for Northern Ireland. You, um, members, the paper by Michael Scholes from RAIS is at page 112 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members if they wish to be briefed on this paper at a meeting in the new year? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's grand. Thank you. Then we're moving on to agenda item 12, which is SL1, Universal Credit Transitional Provision Claimants Previously Entitled to a Severe Disability Payment Amendment, Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. Um, the proposed rule is at page 151 and will amend the Universal Credit Transitional Provisions Regulations Northern Ireland 2016 by setting out the eligibility criteria for new awards of Universal Credit to include a transitional severe disability premium element following the removal of the STP gateway on the 27th of January 2021. <coughs> and, and it will also be by providing that the transitional STP element will immediately be treated in the same way as a universal credit transitional element and preventing anyone who migrates to universal credit on or after the 27th of January 2021 from receiving both the transitional STP element and the transitional element. Um, can I ask members if there are any comments or are they content for the department to proceed to make the rule? Great. Yeah, it's like managed migration. The only thing that I had noted was on page 152, just above where it says consultation, it says at the point of transition. Um, I know that that's saying it's at the point of transmission. So if somebody has a change in circumstances and then they're being moved over onto universal credit, that seems to provide the protection that this isn't just within a like a managed migration period, that it will be at the point that they then shift. So 
whatever, whenever that may be. You know, so somebody may not have a change of circumstances for three or four years. So yeah, as long as that's covered. Do you it? want that information back before we agree, or can we go ahead and agree and ask for the information? Maybe we should just clarify that just okay. to make a hundred percent certain. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. That's fine. So, members, the minister is now with us on Starleaf. So, I'm going to take you back then to agenda item two on your briefing pack. And can I ask then that the minister be brought into spotlight? She has. Um, minister, you are very welcome here to the meeting. And first of all, on behalf of the committee, can I welcome you back? And hope that you're feeling better. And we're delighted to see you, and uh, delighted also to have Carol back with us on committee. Minister, I know when we were starting at nine o'clock, we had 30 minutes of you. Minister, can you just confirm your time yeah. frame for us before we start? Yes, Paula. Apologies, technical glitches. No, I, um, I have to. I have another meeting at 9:30, um, so I have to leave. And again, apologies. Just. The technology just hasn't worked this morning, so I don't even know if you can see me because okay. I've had to phone in to Starleaf rather than through the computer. No, so like sorry that, that's, for that. I know these things happen. We've had these problems in committee for all along, but we, we will we will be asking you then to come back as as soon as possible in the new year, uh, just to make you aware yes, of that. No problem. No, I understand that. Yeah. Okay, members, I, because we only have 10 minutes, you're maybe only going to get two or three people in. I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm opening up straight away to the floor. And please indicate and please be brief. And, Minister, can I ask you to be very brief with your answers? Alex, you have hand up. Yeah, I go ahead, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, welcome back to your position. Um, and happy Thank Christmas you. to you. Um, two quick questions. Um, the first one's on Casement Park. Um, What's the position on, on funding for Casement Park at the moment? Because I know that the, the three sports, rugby, football and GA, there was a set amount of money for that originally um, and it was divided equally. Um, could you give me an update on any increase in, in funding ideas? And in particular, I would say that I believe that the GAA need to make up for any shortfall because the costs seem to be increasing. So that that is my worry about the costs, and I really do think the GA need to stump up for that. And quickly, there's 45 million worth of COVID money um, that hasn't gone to the councils yet. Um, can you explain the, the delay on that, and if that can be speeded up? Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thanks very much, um, Alex, I think it was there, very good to come see you. Um, obviously, I've been under the department, I left in 24 hours, I haven't had an opportunity to speak to all of the staff, um, so apologies for that, but I do know, I mean, I'm meeting with Ulster Council and with the staff team on casement um, soon. Obviously, we know that the figure increased because we've had to go back into the planning system again and just with the course of time. We're still bottoming out um, the business case. Obviously, we had to wait on uh, the planning approval being granted as well to see what conditions were attached to that. So we're still uh, dealing with that at the moment. We're in conversations with the GAA um, in terms of looking at the finances around that because there was a, a pot that was shared amongst, um, obviously, the executive, but also the GAA putting money into it um, as well. And I want to continue those conversations in the time ahead. And I suppose there is a commitment for me to deliver um, on the development of casements and also the sub-regional study as well, as set out in the new decade new approach agreement. So I don't have all the, of the um, defined figures today. I know there, um, there are officials on um, this call as well, if there's anything that they want to add. But I'll, I'll certainly come back in the new year um, in terms of giving more details as we'll have them. And then was there another issue there? Was that answered? Yeah, the forty-five million that hasn't gone to the council. Sorry, for yes, there are engagements ongoing, so a good bit of money has been paid out to local government who have obviously been working really well with the department. We're obviously just going through financial prudency, doing checks, and we're hopeful to release uh, more money in the time ahead on that as well. But there's a constant engagement. I know Anthony is on the call as well, and you may want to get more details. Um, because obviously I haven't had the opportunity as of yet um, to sit down with Anthony, but I know um, that a good bit of the money has slowed out. We're obviously doing some financial checks, uh, working with the council, and as soon as we can have those done, then the money money will be released. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Deirdre, lovely to have you back again. Um, glad you're here. And um, but if I don't say it later on, happy Christmas. Um, very quickly, um, okay. we had received um, uh, the briefing paper. It mentioned in it um, about the consultation outcome of the fundamental review of social housing allocations will be published later this month. Um, is that going to be before Christmas for us? Um, so I'm just asking about that. And then um, the... Sorry, I think I'm just trying to think if there's anything else coming through here. The other one is about councils again. Um, the Department of, or sorry, the Committee for Finance did a report on. I think it was the Committee for Finance or the Committee. For, sorry, it was the Executive Office did um, a report on the impact of Brexit to councils. But I've noticed in the January monitoring round. Um, there isn't an allocation to councils for them to meet the Brexit demands. Have you any thoughts on that for them? Yeah, well, the first thing, Kelly, and thanks very much um, for your warm wishes. The consultation report, I am hopeful that that, that that will be released to the committee tomorrow. Oh, great. Um, we'll just get confirmation and then that will be sent out. So it will be before Christmas um, in terms of that going forward to your sales. In terms of the Brexit stuff, I'm not aware at this moment. I mean, I know there is the 45 million in terms of ring fence funding. I know councils haven't previously been on Belfast, had been planning and looking at mitigations um, around Brexit. But I'll go away and find a bit more detail for you um, and bring it back again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other members in the room want to ask the minister a question in, in the final minutes that we have left here? Um, I'm fired in the New Year, sure. Yeah. Um, Minister, around the sub-regional stadia, um, just about the, the working groups, um, that are just about, what, you know, have they met and what are, what are they doing and what time scale is there for completing these strands of that work and also um, about the money for it? Is it still ring-fenced ring for the programme? And if so, how much is that? Well, I am committed, Paul, as it was when I first came into post, um, that we see uh, the regional and sub-regional stadia programme be delivered. Obviously, we know, particularly with COVID, the impact that sport has um, on our communities and indeed the contribution that sport and clubs, um, soccer, GAA, rugby and others have made in the midst of the COVID pandemic as well. So I am keen um, as soon as we can. I know that I had instructed a review looking at the sub-regional stadia as well because some time had lapsed. Um, again, I haven't got to meet the officials um, in the last 24 hours. I know that that work was continuing. Um, so I will be meeting with staff in the coming days and weeks around this. Um, and then I will update the committee in the new year. No, I, and I absolutely understand that. I know that you haven't been back very long and you'll not be briefed over everything in such a large department. But if you could just get some of that information um, back to the committee, that, that certainly would be good. You did mention there when you were talking about um, sport and about sport in general and, and how we absolutely know that our, our sporting clubs and sporting organisations have been great um, over this year. But we are we certainly, I know as a constituency MLA and I know as a committee, are getting serious correspondence from various, um, you know, whether that's dance classes and um, children's sport, especially and ch ch children's physical activity, which is which is paramount for their mental health as well. And yet, um, they are still being left out in the cold. I know that was brought. I brought it up with Carol, or someone brought David Hilditch. It was brought it up with Carol when she was minister a couple of weeks ago, and she would said she would be looking further at those regulations. Um, just to ask you, then, has that been looked at? Or do you know if that's been looked at? And you know, when will we see some clear direction for those many um, sporting organisations that uh, that uh, and classes and various things for children? No, I know it's a, a key issue, and obviously I know even in recent days, and that I mean, I've had the same correspondence um, as well from organisations. Obviously, you're aware the executive is meeting today. We know critically, even you know where the the hospital and the health system is at the moment. Um, in terms of coming into the Christmas period and getting into the new year. So, again, I haven't had the opportunity yet to um, speak to the branch. I know Tony and others may be on the call here that may be able to give a bit more detail. But obviously, as somebody who played some of the eggs involved in sports myself, at the, the contribution that it plays in terms of the health and well-being of young people, um, and if I can find ways of getting young people back into sports again, um, in the midst of this pandemic, then I want to find ways to do that. So, again, I'm going to be engaging with staff on this issue, obviously working with the health department as well, in terms of looking at the risk assessments around all of these and engaging with 
the sporting codes um, themselves. So I will update members in due course. Um, again, unless there's any of my officials that are online um, that do want to come in um, with more specifics around this, but I will update the committee if I can do that in writing, you know, before Christmas or before I, I come back in front of you again um, on all of these issues, um, I'll make sure that I can do that. No, and look, I, and I thank you for that. I mean, I'm just very conscious, and the people are conscious out there that you are the champion on that executive for the for all of those sporting organisations, bodies, and individuals. And you know, and they want to make sure that uh, I want to be assured that you are fighting for them on their behalf. Um, but, you know, as we go through the next coming months, which will be which will be vitally important as well. Um, members, is there any other questions? We are, Sinead is having major difficulty. I see she's back on again because I know her internet isn't great where she is. Um, uh, I just want to know, Sinead, have you any questions or are you okay to let the minister go? <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid if I, could, if I started talking, I would, you wouldn't, this connection's not great. So yeah, I no, caught the end of that just about. Yeah, you're breaking up on us, Sinead, a wee bit. I'll let you go again. So well, um, Minister. Okay, there. That wasn't too bad. Mark Durkin has also dropped off the line. Um, his internet connection is not great either. Um, so, Minister, we will let you go. You're nine thirty, um, and I know that Pardon. your officials have said that they can stay on the line. Um, yeah. So yeah, that would try. be. Let me see. That's Jacqueline and who else? Karen. Anthony. No, hold Anthony. on. Anthony. 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 Sorry. Anthony. Sorry. So if we can bring Jacqueline and Anthony into the spotlight just and say cheerio to you, Minister, and thank you for your time today and wish you a Merry Thanks Christmas. Thanks very much, everyone. And certainly we would be, uh, we'd be um, happy if you could send any uh, more detailed replies to any of the questions that have been asked. Thank you. No, I'll follow up. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Bye. thank you. I can see you, Jacqueline. I can see your face, so I can. Um, so, Jacqueline, I don't know if there's anything further you wanted to add to any of those comments the Minister made with further information. Um, Chair, I'm a Director of the Regional Stadia Programme, okay. so I was here specifically to support the Minister on Casement Park. Um, if any officials or any, any, any from the committee have any questions, um, I suppose, yes, we haven't had a chance to fully brief the Minister yet. I'm um, looking forward to doing that. Um, there has been significant progress in recent months, and uh, not, with, uh, not in, uh, least of which was the planning and notice of opinion in November. Um, which has gone through council now, but yes, to, to add to the answer to um, uh, the question there, the, fun, the funding and the, um, the funding split is very much to the fore of, of officials and, uh, and the accounting officer and SRO at the moment. Uh, we're working with the GAA and uh, we'll be starting a series of negotiations in the new year on that funding split. CPD are assisting in a due diligence exercise at the moment uh, on the cost of the project, which have gone up in the in the intervening six years. Um, they're doing a detailed analysis of that, and we're working and supporting the GAA with their FBC through DOF at the moment as well. So very much on that interdependent stream of costs, assurance, and funding, and that's certainly our focus at the moment. Um, thank you, Jacqueline, for that. You've mentioned costs there. Can you give any estimated indication of what the costs might be at all at this stage, or would you rather not say at this stage? I'm afraid I can't because CPD haven't completed their, their due diligence exercise uh, at the moment, but um, we will be in a position after after Christmas to be um, working through that and the cost will be inserted into the final business case as it goes through DOF into the last phase of its analysis. Okay, okay. Uh, hold on, just for bringing in Kelly, I see Mark is back in with us. Mark, the Minister has gone on now at this stage, but we do have some officials with him. I'm going to go to Kelly and then I'll come to you. And I, I know you've had difficulties there this morning too. Yes. So I'm going to Kelly first and then I'll come to yourself, Mark. Kelly. Jacqueline, I was just wondering, um, when it comes to the sub-regional stadia, uh, that budget obviously is going to be quite limited in comparison to um, the Casement Park and previous stadia funding. Um, I'm just wondering, has there been any consideration with CPD about um, the way that that funding is going to be rolled out so that there can be bulk purchase um, reductions built in? So, for instance, um, if, sub if the sub-regional stadia have projects, is there any way that they, they can have similar suppliers or the same suppliers in order to reduce 
reduce down the costs, you know, so that each individual project across Northern Ireland isn't having to go and reinvent the wheel every time. Um, is, there, is there any thoughts on how to make that as cost efficient as possible and cutting down the red tape for those stadia? We've seen how long it's taken Casement Park. Uh, we don't want that to happen for the, the rest of the football fraternity outside of the larger stadia. That's a really interesting observation. I think that will very much depend on the, the final uh, strands that make up the programme. As we know, initially in the first uh, in the first proposals for sub-regional, there, there were very much different tiers um, of complexity and number numbers of investment and size of investments. The, the part that officials are doing at the moment is to go back to basics and look at those strands again, um, to, to go very much, much back to where the need is. And that will build up the structure of the program again and once the structure of the program is built up and the strands are redefined you're absolutely quite right we should look at how those are procured and how they're managed um, so it's too early at the moment yet um, but uh, that certainly is um, something that will be on the agenda how these how these strands are procured and how they can be done so efficiently and you're right supply chain management is a is a very important way of getting efficiencies across the across the piece so a bit early yet, but certainly should be on the agenda for discussion. And can I just check as well, um, when it comes to planning permissions, one of the things that could hold this up, as we know, could be planning permissions and, and concerns about that. Has there been any discussion from the department or consideration within the department of how to approach or deal with um, councils to ensure that planning permission um, is processed as efficiently as possible so that the plans aren't yeah. held up um, because as we know yeah. the longer the plans are held up then the more costs can be added yeah well hopefully with smaller less complex projects there shouldn't be the same issues in planning i mean Kisman park for example is a very very large complex project the strands coming out of sub-region shouldn't be as complex this should be smaller and most of them should be able to stay at council level but you're right um, we should be doing everything we can to make sure that's a streamlined process but um, when the projects are smaller and less complicated the planning should follow um, and again it's too early to discuss that but it, it should be a much more streamlined process and we'll do everything we can to ensure that's the case Thank, thank you very much, Jacqueline, and happy Christmas to you and your team. Thank you. Now, thank you. Unfortunately, Jacqueline, I don't know if Anthony is on here or not. I see the withheld number. Can we move then the withheld number up into spotlight? There we go. We've got it. Is that you, Anthony, then? Can you hear uh, us? Well, I, I hope that I'm on the phone, so I hope, I hope it's me you're seeing, or I, my telephone number. We can, we can, well, no, you're no. not seeing it. We can see withheld. You'll be glad to know that nobody can see no. your telephone number, or we will all be pestering you, so you'll be very glad to know that. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move, Mark, I'm sorry that you're dropped off during most of that, um, but say Jacqueline and Anthony are still with us. If you have any questions and, and any other questions, we're more than happy to forward them to the Minister for answer. So, Mark, do you want to go ahead? Okay, uh, thank you, Chair, and sorry, I, I missed the opportunity to welcome the Minister back. It's, it's great that she's back on her feet and back behind the desk again. Uh, my questions were largely going to be around welfare mitigations. I don't know if that had been touched touched on while I had lost connection there, but like, we, we are aware that primary legislation is needed to ensure that welfare mitigations go beyond March 21, so that's three months away really, but we still haven't seen any sign of it. Uh, I, I know the committee had expressed a view beforehand that we would really want sight and scrutiny of in, any such legislation, but that window is closing and closing fast and it's not just the committee uh, stakeholders who have a lot they offer i think in that regard in, in terms of the design of any new mitigations and to ensure that there aren't gaps that, that people can fall through as they have done with the existing uh, package are closed i was just wondering do you know what the situation is there do you know to do, do ensure that this legislation gets full scrutiny and, and, and doesn't rush through an accelerated passage or, or, or is it even going to go down that route? Jacqueline or Anthony, do you know the answer to any of that? Uh, sorry, it's Anthony, Chair. I can definitely confirm I do not know the answer to that. <laughs> okay. um, but what I will do is I'll contact uh, colleagues in the department as soon as we're finished here and, and try to get an update through. Apologies, it's just not in my area at all, and I really wouldn't want to hazard a guess. No, that's okay. No, 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 no,
Yeah, I thought uh, that, and Mark, certainly from this, um, we can then, from this meeting, that's definitely one of the questions that will be being asked to the Minister. I think you're absolutely right. We don't want to be blindsided at the last minute without having the appropriate time to scrutinise that or those or those independent people to come in um, and give us a briefing on what their views are. So, yeah, Mark, sorry about that. So, uh, anything else, Mark, or any to add to that? Just if, if Anthony and Jacqueline could, could check them if the welfare mitigation legislation is even drafted and, and if it will include mitigations uh, for the two child tax rule and the, the bedroom tax. Uh, like I had revealed to me in an answer to a written question during the week that there are currently 227 families here being hit by it, which is up about 50 families from last year. So, so, so there are still people uh, falling through the, the cracks here. Uh, and, and it's very important that we close those cracks, like I say. And then in, in terms of uh, Minister Nicoline's housing statement, that I think it's fair to say was broadly welcomed by all, uh, I just had a couple of wee queries on it, and it's in terms of the, the, the splitting, if you like, if the housing executive. This is going to take a long time, and people might have different views on, on that aspect of it. But currently, do we know what the exact legislative impediment is to the housing executive as it is uh, building houses? And, and do you know, is there something that could be done quicker than what the, the, the minister's proposing? Okay, and Anthony or Jacqueline? Um, I, I'm not sorry, Chair. I'm not fully aware of what the, the legislative uh, impediment. I know the, the Housing Secretary worked on our development um, schedule. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the issues with, with the Housing Secretary are uh, financial and, and, and around the capacity to borrow and, and purchase land. But again, if uh, you can leave that with me, try to get, get something back to the, the assembly very quickly on, on that specific question. Sorry, back to the committee on that question. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Mark. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Anthony. Sorry for putting you guys <laughs> on, 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 on the clock here, and I'm not going to shoot the messengers. Nor was I going to shoot the messenger. Don't don't worry about that. No, thank you, and I look forward to uh, speaking to the minister again. Sorry, I missed her this morning. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, there's no other members have uh, indicated that they want to ask anything further of yourselves, Jacqueline or Anthony, and I know that you're here under your own specific remit, so <laughs> weren't able to answer um, some of those thank questions. You. But, um, look, thank you very much for staying on with us and for answering what you could. Uh, we really do appreciate that. And uh, so thank you and Merry Christmas. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you very much. Christmas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, members. Then, so we have a few actions from that briefing. Um, it was it was regrettable that the minister was unable yeah. to get on, but we all know that technology sometimes, certainly within this committee, has been problematic. Um, and we know. Uh, I mean, Sinead at the moment has messaged me to say that she is finding it extremely difficult to get any connection at the moment. But we'll try our best to come back and forward. But there are a few points. There are more than a few points that have been brought off. So then, can I then just propose that all of those points um, that we also write and not just rely on the department getting back to us, but also write it formally then to them, um, those points, and if there was anything else, and um, then also then ask the minister if she can come in and brief us again um, in early, uh, well, early January, as early as we get back in January, um, for uh, to try and fit her in for a briefing then as well. Remember, was happy with that, or any other comment, Kelly, you want to say I was going to say, later on in our pack, we're, we're going to talk about the, the January monitoring round, yeah. and there will be a lot more questions coming out through in that. I'm really disappointed that the Minister had that technical difficulties. It's not her fault, but um, we do need time with the Minister um, and with officials to do this. So um, I don't know. We have a very busy um, schedule coming up with the liquor licensing, but I think we need to get at least an hour with her with no technical difficulties. Um, and maybe that connection between the, the department and our IT system, um, we could think about that for our first meeting um, because there's too much important stuff coming forward for us just to have that amount of time. No, I quite agree, and I think it might be a case that we might have to hold a meeting starting even earlier. It could be an 8 a.m. meeting that we maybe have to do um, to get a full hour with the um, 
Uh, just saying lots of nodding heads here. Um, seven would do me. <laughs> seven for Alex, he said. That's, That's fair enough. Important. I mean, I, th I think as members, none of us mind that. Um, we, we, and, and everybody has the ability to come in via Starleaf if they need to, if that causes some difficulty. So that's not a problem. Mark, you're talking and we can't hear you. So I'm just wondering what you're saying there. Don't bring Mark back into the spotlight. Mark, what did you say? Oh, I, I was bothering. I was just talking to myself. So you says we all have the ability to come in through Starleaf, and we don't always have that ability, as this morning has demonstrated. I know. I'm just being told here by the committee clerk. There's two things. The committee clerk, she said that two letters um, on welfare mitigation arrived late yesterday. Um, so there were too late to get out to members. That will be fo they'll be forwarded on to members. And also, I brought up the issue about um, grassroots sports. A letter was sent also to the committee late yesterday. Again, too late to put even into your table papers. So that will get out to members. Also, so are members happy enough? Then, if we then invite the minister next time, we invite the minister back, and it will be in January and as early as we can in January. We then look at an 8 a.m. start. Do you allow for that longer time for filler? Yes. Yeah. Happy enough with that? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. Do, do, go ahead. Do, 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 do. In terms of, of that letter or those letters that have come in the mitigation, so if you just keep them handy on your desk there, because Kelly has mentioned the briefing we're getting on the monitoring round, and there'll be a couple of uh, mitigation specific questions at that stage uh, and some of the answers might lie in those letters at least i hope they do well, they may well do i don't have the letters i have i have two yellow post-its on my desk <laughs> and they don't just have it out the letters um so they so have there might be as many answers on the post-its yeah well this is also true mark we find that you and i are here long enough to know that sometimes that happens um so i just want to then um can we finish that session that agenda item there Members agreed? Yeah, agreed. Okay. Members then, what I want to do now is then propose that we go into a closed session for our next agenda item, which is a short, short briefing from Assembly Research on a research paper in the PAC um, on the impact of COVID-19 in the arts sector. I don't uh, uh, imagine it'll be any longer than 10 or 15 minutes. So can I ask members, it's not something I would normally do, but I think it's necessary before the arts briefing. Can I ask members, are they content for us to go into closed session? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Then I need to just read out the following. Um, members, we are now going to move into closed session. Could I ask communications to ensure that all witnesses that had joined the meeting by Starleaf Star have now left the meeting, apart from our Assembly researcher, Cal Karen McCallion, and of course, Mark Durkin. And then I'm going to go and switch off for now. This Hello. is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, we've come out of closed session and the meeting is back open again. Um, I'm just going to take a quick break so members take their ease while we get um, prepared for the next session. Thank you. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. OK, members, welcome back. We're going to move on then to Agenda Item 7, which is an Arts Council briefing on the impact of COVID-19 on the arts sector. Members, you'll find this at page 70 of your meeting pack. And then can I welcome to the meeting Roshi McDonough, who is the Chief Executive, Noreen McKinney, who is Director of Arts Development, and Paul Harron, who is Director of Operations. Um, you are all very welcome today to the meeting. And then, Roshi, can I pass over to you to begin your brief? I don't know if you can hear me, Roshin, Noreen and Paul. We're having great difficulties this morning with all of our technology, again. Um, Nev and I seem to have disappeared. Roshin, Noreen or Paul, can any of you hear me? It's like a seance. <laughs> it's like a seance. <laughs> Is there anybody there? <laughs> um, okay. Right, folks, here we go again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, look, I'm going to just stop the meeting again for a few moments. Do we try and see if we can get these technical difficulties sorted out, folks? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay, members, we're back again uh, in the room to agenda item number seven. And can again, can I welcome Roshin, Noreen, and Paul to the meeting? And Roshin, can I ask you to begin your, begin your presentation? Thank you very much, Chair. We're pleased to be here again. And as you said, I'm joined by my two colleagues, um, Paul Harn, who's our Director of Operations and, and responsible for all the operational aspects of our grant giving and Noreen, um, who is our Director of Arts Development and so responsible for the overarching artistic uh, dimension of our work. Uh, this is our second appearance at the committee uh, and one which um, takes place, I think, in a very different context. At the first meeting, uh, we were making a case to the committee for much needed support for the arts and cultural sector uh, as the COVID pan pandemic wiped out um, the already precarious livelihoods of those who work uh, in our sector, as indeed it did in other uh, aspects of society. And we thank you uh, for your uh, part in helping us get those resources. 
We were pleased when our minister announced and were relieved uh, an initial package of 1.5 million and then a subsequent 4.5 million for the creative support fund. And then when she managed to secure the money set aside for the uh, arts, culture and heritage sectors uh, in late October this year, uh, arising from the Barnet consequentials and then charged us subsequently with helping deliver the majority of that to the arts and creative sector. So I want to update the committee on our progress in doing that. From the outset, we've worked closely with the department and its officials in co-designing the programmes to help stabilise and secure our sector. We've already sent you a paper detailing the level and passions of funding distributed to date, so I won't repeat that information. But in summary, we've We've opened six new programmes since April this year. We've made 1,647 awards so far and distributed 8.3 million of the 19 million that we've been allocated. And that's on top of our normal programmes and I owe a debt of gratitude to our staff who've worked extraordinarily hard to do just that. We've opened two further programmes recently. In fact, the final round for individuals opens today. And I want to say a few words about the current programmes. The Stability uh, and Renewal programme for organisations has a budget of £7.75 million, and we've received 185 eligible applications requesting over £24 million. The footprint is wide and includes large commercial organisations working in the live entertainment industry, as well as cinema, for example, and they have significant needs. Priority will be given to help clear COVID deficits in order to try and stabilise organisations where possible and help them survive beyond the pandemic. Not all will, and the committee will appreciate from the size and volume of requests received that exceedingly difficult choices will have to be made if more resources cannot be secured. We are currently assessing applications and will make decisions uh, on organisations at the end of January. The final Individual Emergency Resilience Programme opened today, as I said, though the guidance notes and the frequently asked questions uh, were on our website several weeks ago, so individuals could gather uh, any man mandatory documentation required. Already over 1,300 individuals have benefited uh, from previous programmes. This one closes on the 7th of January and awards will be made in February against a budget of £3.25 million. We expect that it too will be oversubscribed and individuals can apply for up to £5,000 uh, and there's an extra £2,500 for deaf disabled um, artists who need additional support. This will bring the COVID budgets allocated by the department and the executive under the various strands to over £7.5 million for individuals and for organisations to just under £12 million. I also want to place on record our thanks to the University of Ulster and their Future Screens programme, which has contributed a further 200k to help individual creative practitioners. Now, all this emergency funding has, of course, had a positive impact on the creative work that artists, arts organisations and others um, have still been able to produce in these times, often of great ingenuity, the majority of it freely available online and reaching audiences across the world and at home many of them new to arts consumption. And whilst that is true, nonetheless, our creative practitioners and those who nurture and help sustain them across the creative industries are still struggling for their very survival. Chair, it is the overarching hope, indeed, objective of both the Arts Council and I believe the department that these vital programmes will help us get through the pandemic and come out the other end with, I hope, a balanced and recognisable creative sector which supports those who work in it across all roles and skill areas, and one which also sustains the diverse underpinning ecology of which it is comprised. That's a very challenging task, um, as I know you will appreciate, and we would ask for the committee's support in securing the further necessary resources to deliver on that ambition. Um, Without those resources, we genuinely fear for the future of our collective creative sector. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Roisin. Um, uh, anybody else part of the presentation or do you want us just to go straight into questions now? 
Roshan? Sure, we, we kept it brief so that you could um, ask your, pose your questions to us and Noreen and Paul will also be answering questions. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, Roshan, for that. And you're very welcome back um, with us. And I, I can say that the committee have lobbied hard on the behalf of everyone within the arts sector. We do understand very much the great value that that plays um, to society and the health in Northern Ireland as well. So we, we have been champion, championing it and will continue to do so. You have, you have our word on that also. Um, I have a few technical questions before I want to ask something a bit more, um, a, a bit more information on. Um, the first one then is to do with the upgrade of your computer system. We had heard that um, we've been advised that, that that was happening. Just to ask you first, has that had any impact on any of your funding programmes or will it have any impact? And then the second one then is to do with um, the, the funding awards that have already um, gone out or the ones that are due to go out. Just what is the, the, the time limit or the average waiting times on those for, for those groups or, or individuals to receive their funding? I'm going to bring Paul in on that um, issue, Chair. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, in terms of our uh, systems upgrade, uh, so that is a process that needed to happen uh, within the Arts Council in any case. Uh, it's really a migration of our grants management system to the cloud. Uh, obviously, since we've been in lockdown and remote working, there have been, uh, you know, it, it's there. Remote working brings its own pressures, so it's, it was essential that we um, moved to the cloud, undertook that process in order to kind of speed up our systems, but it had to happen in any case. But to answer your question, it hasn't had any impact directly. We've been um, very careful to streamline our grants programmes alongside this um, migration process, which we undertook between um, between open uh, opening of programmes. So it has now taken place, uh, where, uh, which has enabled us to then uh, open uh, our launch, our IERP2, uh, which is the second individual's emergency resilience programme today, uh, because we are, have now migrated to the cloud, but it hasn't had a detrimental impact. We have deliberately um, sought to, uh, to, to factor that into our work plan um, in order to kind of really make sure that uh, we keep everything on track. Okay, and then I just then asked about the average waiting times for, uh, the, for these grants after the application process closes. So again, the, the turnaround of those is, is, is fairly speedy, but it is dependent on the recipient. Uh, so really, as soon as a, an award has been uh, made, what happens there is a letter of offer goes out to the successful applicant and then they have a, a, a two-week period to accept it. And then um, after that, then they just need to ensure that they give us the mandatory sort of documentation that you'd expect with any kind of acceptance of a grant. And then it, it really gets, it flows out of our finance department fairly rapidly afterwards. So it, the, the vast majority of people do that very quickly and the money goes out very quickly. So there, there isn't time delay there. I can't give you an average as such, but um, you know, I'd say it's really in a matter of, of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks really, usually. No, and that's good to know. I certainly haven't had any any indication that it has been uh, that people applicants have had to wait uh, a laborious length, lengthy time. So I, I I just was asking. I haven't had any anything to the contrary on that. So I haven't at all. Um, I suppose then just uh, a further questions uh, just leading on then. Um, Nor or, sorry, Roshin, you had said there about the the organisational grants that were out that, that uh, was that closed recently that you had 185 eligible, isn't that correct? Um, with looking at, a, a, if we had it, a possible 25 million. Is that, was that the correct figure? Did I get that right? 185 chair with um, uh, an ask of just over yeah. 24 million with a budget of only 7.75 so far. Yeah, which I know is extremely difficult for you and for, for everyone that has applied. And we know for many years in Northern Ireland that the arts sector has been underfunded. There's no doubt about that. We absolutely know that. But we also know we had a research paper done before we had our briefing session here, and we know that in other jurisdictions, awards, um, especially for individual artists, um, have been potentially um, much more generous than, than what we have been giving out here in Northern Ireland. Um, can you shed any, any light on that for the committee as to why that, the reasoning behind that? 
And I know it's not your fault, but I'm just asking is, if you know of any reason yeah. behind that. Chair, just to say that, <coughs> excuse me, um, across the Arts Councils, we have all, uh, as Chief Executive, has been talking to each other about the nature and type of programmes and the level of awards that we're able to variously make. So I just want to assure um, the committee that we um, do um, draw on each other's experiences. And in terms of the hardship funds, my understanding um, is that you know, five thousand pounds is is um, the maximum award for hardship. They they will run. I suspect we all run variously different kinds of schemes, which are not necessarily the hardship funds that we're talking about in this instance related to COVID. Uh, and so, um, and obviously, circumstances and policy drivers are perhaps different um, in different jurisdictions um, with the level of uh, funding that is available. But our, our um, grant, uh, which is currently open, um, allows and has consistently allowed, I think, for up to £5,000 for individuals. And then, as I said, with the um, additional support for deaf and disabled artists who might require it. Okay. Sure, could I, yes, could I just add, add to that? Um, I know also in Scotland, um, they have essential and generous development grants for career artists. Um, something that we would look at with envy, and those are given over a three-year period. Um, again, and I think those development funds, um, and professional development funds, are up to 100k. We could only dream of that level of resource, and as I said, it is over um, a three-year period for sustained development. So it's quite different. Uh, which <coughs> has the distinction between that and hardship funding, which is what we're looking at this year. In a normal year for us, we do have major awards, which are up to £15,000, and those are uh, essential, um, very, very competitive. Um, in, in an average year, we can make about four of those. So that it all comes down to those per capita figures and the amount of resource that we have available. But just to put that further in perspective, yeah, and no, I understand that, and thank you for that. And again, that uh, again draws attention to the fact that the arts in, no in Northern Ireland are, are are really are the poor relations um, uh, across the UK when it comes to funding. And again, that's no reflection on yourselves, so it isn't. Um, those major those major awards and and all of that other funding. Not talking about any of the hardship funding, any of that extra funding. Um, that funding stream that you normally would have. Um, have you been able to continue with that, those forms of funding, or have you had to diversify that form of funding in any way? Um, what we did immediately um, in March was we repurposed any international um, funding programmes that we had, and those are usually aimed at individuals to allow them to take up residencies, travel, go to other places, to share practice and all of that. And those were put into the initial pot that Roisin has mentioned there, the Creative Support Fund. 500k of that was repurposed Arts Council funds. But we did this year run our Support for Individual Artists programme with a budget Paul Keep Me Right. I, I'm not quoted, but Paul can give you that budget. Um, so we did run that along with the, you know, the first wave of the um, IERP which was quite challenging and our normal criteria pertained there, um, you know, where we would be very much assessing on quality. Um, obviously, the emergency programmes are not looking at quality, it's looking purely at financial need, loss of income and trying to retain people in the sector. We'll pick up the um, major awards uh, post 31st of March because that's our lottery funding and we have we don't have year-end pressures there, so we will be doing that as soon as we can, uh, as soon as we've delivered uh, the, the emergency funding. Um, uh, Chair, I can just come in to add to what Noreen has said with regard to the support for the Individual Artist Programme, uh, the general awards this year. Uh, we were able to make 242 SIAP awards to a total amount of £473,810, and that was running concurrently with IERP1, that's the Emergency Resilience Programme, the first call of that. So those were, those, um, were um, uh, announced uh, within the same week uh, at the beginning of October. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you for that. 
Um, then I just want to move on then to uh, sort of future planning and looking into the future. And we know um, that, well, we don't know who knows what lies ahead in the year ahead for us. And um, we, uh, we don't know how much more the, the entire art sector is going to suffer in the year ahead. So it's looking at that future planning and um, uh, the, the possibility of a, a cultural recovery task force. Um, and I know that was brought up to us by the Arts Collaboration Network. Just to ask from an Arts Council perspective, would you be supportive of such a task force? And, if, uh, and have you had any discussions with the department regarding such a task force? Well, um, I think in general, yes, we would be very supportive of um, any form of uh, any focus that would and any structure that would deal with the the real and pressing needs of the wider cultural sector. So yes, we would be in favour of that. We have spoken to the department, and um, the minister I think is very keen to develop uh, a wider and longer term arts and cultural strategy, which would be I think owned. Uh, by the executive as a whole and recognised as being the strategy for arts and culture in Northern Ireland. So I know that's not the same thing. However, I think both are related with respect to focusing on the recovery needs of the sector, but looking um, to its longer term ambitions and the role that it plays in our wider society. I think those two should go hand in hand. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right there as well. I mean, it is cross-departmental when we look at the arts, um, especially, I mean, it will fall into it will fall into executive office, it will fall into health, it can even fall into justice and many other um, departments. So I do think it needs to be um, that collaborative working across the executive on that. And I know certainly as a committee, we will be continuing to ask those questions uh, about um, a recovery plan and, uh, and the possibility of a task force going forward. So thank you for answering that. Um, just my final question is to do with data gallery. Um, I, I know I've been here long enough to know that uh, here in Northern Ireland, we're, we're pretty poor when it comes to data gathering across the board, um, no matter which department that might be in. Um, so I'm just asking you, and the department had mentioned to us as well when they were in briefing us um, about the lack of data um, within your sector as well. Um, and it's just to ask about the, the, the amount of data that has been submitted to you with, with applicants for funding programme. Um, can you use that data um, to, for information gathering and um, can it then, and, and what way do you imagine you could use it um, going forward and planning for future? We, um, we do collect data, Chair, you're quite correct. Uh, we've run several surveys um, uh, recently during the course of the pandemic to ascertain what the effects were on people's income, livelihoods, their morale, how they saw the future, what was their level and type of skill, how long they'd been out of work, were they furloughed, were they not furloughed. So we've collected quite a bit of data through a couple of surveys and we will be doing a further survey um, in probably February once the um, programs have been delivered to individuals and to organizations we will be undertaking those twin surveys again mm -hmm. for comparative um, uh, purposes to see how people have fared throughout the pandemic and, and what effect um, it has continues to have on them so that's the first thing to say but in terms of the um, applications that we receive yes there are um, there, there, there are types of data and information that we seek um, from applicants and that we collate those and in turn our, our normal practice is that we would do an annual funding survey um, of the clients that we support and we get them to tell us things like um, how many people are employed in your organisation, how many volunteers do you have, what type and level of engagement do you have with your um, with your community, um, uh, be that in a local area or in an art form discipline, what are your audience numbers like, what, how many workshops do you run. So we collect quite a lot of detailed data from our, our funded clients and uh, routinely uh, and, our, and our artists as well. Um, obviously with this pandemic and the wider footprint that we've been asked to try and support and help stabilise across the whole creative industries piece. 
the collection of that data um, was not within our purview originally, but we are collecting information now in conjunction with the University of Ulster, for example, who've helped us with um, various surveys through um, Future Screens NI that I mentioned earlier. And indeed, we've been talking to the department and their statisticians um, who do produce information on the creative industry's footprint in Northern Ireland. But yes, data collection is is an ongoing um, an ongoing issue. Okay, no, thank you, Roshan, and that, that's good to know. And then I would hope then at some stage um, during the year next year, um, we could maybe get a presentation from yourselves. It will certainly help us as a committee and inform us as a committee um, when we look at, at the future planning for the arts. Um, so thanks that. I'm going to open up to members now. I have Kelly has signalled, so if any other members can signal if they want to speak then. Robin, Kelly, go ahead. Thank you very much, Roisin, and thank you very much for your team. It's been um, a year and a half for yourselves, so we absolutely recognise the amount of work that you guys have had to put in. Um, just talking, uh, following on from the Chair's question about data, um, I'm sure that you are now in contact with parts of the, the arts sector who've never, ever thought about coming to yourselves um, before. I'm thinking in particular of, say, gigging musicians and, and those businesses that are involved in the arts. Um, but I wanted to ask you about them. So you'll be collating the data on those, and hopefully that will give us a bit more information about the state of the sector. Um, obviously not at this stage, but perhaps next year, will there be an opportunity to pull together a state of the sector that reflects more the breadth and width of the the, the types of artists, musicians, bands, venues, um, and, and how this has really impacted? I know University of Ulster is doing a piece of work on that, but will there be an opportunity? Are you hoping to ask the Minister for Money to enable you to build your knowledge base? And I think you, know, you put your finger on a very important area. And certainly, as I referenced, the footprint with which um, we have been asked to engage is much wider um, than we would traditionally have done. There is no doubt about that. And it's been a very interesting and informative and indeed, I think, positive experience um, for us as an organisation to relate to individuals um, whose creative practice we wouldn't particularly been aware of previously but we knew that they were out there and they're working in very different contexts um, to some of our artists and arts organizations. And um, that, 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 as I said, has been very, it's been a very important experience for us. And I think um, in terms of the research into what the creative industries actually looks like in Northern Ireland, who works in it, um, what kinds of practice, what is the wider ecology that also sustains it? Because we're also very conscious that there are very many um, companies that underpin are in the supply chain, for example, the events companies and others whose work feeds into and is sustained as part of that wider ecology. So I think that's a very um, significant uh, body of work to try and understand the dynamics of how that sector actually functions. And I think, you know, that's been some of our learning. And I think not just us as an organization, but I think others too, who didn't quite appreciate the interconnectedness of that fragile ecology uh, uh, and how extensive and diverse it was. So I think the prospect of being able to do some research to try and better understand those dynamics is, is one that we would welcome and we would be more than willing to play our part in and I think we need to you know go back to the department and work with the department as we have been doing to better understand um, that part of our society and its dynamics and its needs. And, and just flowing on from that I'm just thinking about the social contribution we know that some of the applications that you've had to process um, require um, people to you know prove that connectivity to the wider community. But I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity then to reconsider what that social contribution is? Because as we all know, um, you know, hearing music can lift your spirits. Um, it's part of, of, without it actually being a program that's delivered in a community hall or online for a group, it's even just that, um, and how 
the arts and the various arts uh, parts of the arts within it, um, we have depended upon so much throughout COVID. You know, hearing a musician's voice, and I know you mentioned Ryan McMullen from very close from me, Port of Ferry, um, in your in your documents. Um, hearing music, seeing something that's beautiful. Um, you know, it, it's you know being part of. Uh, you know, an art installation, um, all of that can lift someone's spirits. So the social contribution is more than just what somebody is delivering with outputs, you know, that can be measured um, as part of a, a funding programme. Will there be an opportunity then to re-evaluate how social contribution is measured or, or considered in funding applications to ensure that we just absolutely recognise art for art's sake and musicians and bands and how important that all is to our lives? Uh, music, um, proverbial music to our ears. Um, Kelly, when, when you say that, I mean, the intrinsic value um, of art and its creation is immeasurable in many ways other than the joy um, you know, and the delight um, that it can bring into our lives. Absolutely agree. And I suppose the arts have always, for a long time, ever since I can remember, have always been asked, well, what are you doing in terms of, you know, poverty and social inclusion? How many jobs are you creating? How are you, um, you know, we, we, there's been a burden put on the arts in terms of delivery of outputs and outcomes, I think that has been at times, um, unnecessary and not um, the best way always of looking at the contribution the arts makes. So I think we need to have some kind of balancing of that whole idea that art can bring joy. It doesn't necessarily have to um, achieve a particular um, outcome um, that is a, a, a government objective, though it does and it will continue to do that, um, but it has an inherent value. Uh, and that's something that needs to be recognised and sustained through supporting um, artists and their creative practice uh, and getting um, the best quality and the, giving the best development and support we can to our artists. Thank you. And just finally, um, the, the, the piece that's being released today for individual people, um, can I just double check the awards that will be made? Um, obviously, they'll be going out in February. Does that have to be spent by the end of March or can that be ruled through by that artist until um, later in the year, next year? The money all has to be um, spent by the end of March, but it's really deficits. We're, we're, we're wanting to give people um, and individual creative practitioners support because they will have incurred loss of income that they haven't been able to earn anything in this pandemic. And so as long as they can give us evidence of that, well, then they can use the money for whatever purpose, but it will, um, they will get the award and it's up to them how they use it. We haven't put any um, um, inhibitors or any restrictions um, on that, but it's to recognise the crisis that they faced. Yeah. Is there any um, opportunity, Roisin, just moving forward for the Arts Council, as was mentioned by your, your colleague Noreen, um, this development? Because what we are, and I'm sure you're finding it, I know having been a grants issue in body in the past, my heart used to be broke whenever you had new applicants coming forward who just didn't have the experience of filling out forms. Is there anything that you guys are thinking about um, for development of, of those or those individuals that are involved in the arts in the widest sense so that they're able to apply for funding in the future because you know charities and organizations can be very good at this but when you're coming to this new it's almost like a closed club that you don't know how to get into is there any opportunity there for you guys moving forward i would bring Lauren in this but before i do to say that we've been talking um with the with future screens um at the university of ulster who are um, wanting to develop precisely such a, a, a development agency um, independently that people can go to and receive the professional support and mentoring that they require in order to um, be able to access the resources that are available. It's obviously hard for um, a funding body itself to help people fill in application forms because, well, for the obvious reasons, I won't state them. But I want to bring in Noreen now because I wanted to say that uh, we have run I, countless Zoom clinics 
um, by individual staff members and indeed a whole slew um, of webinars um, in the last few days. And Noreen can give you some detail around that, um, Chair yeah. Kelly. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think that's been a real feature of this year, um, Kelly, and something that we would definitely, we have learned from. It's been a very rewarding experience, I find especially, um, well, individual clinics, we're, we're holding them this week for the IERP. There were back-to-back -back, um, Monday and Tuesday, and then we've two more sessions tomorrow. Um, what we'll do is not everybody can join those, and, you know, we can't cater for everybody on Zoom, but we'll publish um, what the webinar, and we'll publish all questions that were asked. Some of those are in addition to what you would find in the frequently asked questions. Uh, we held very large webinars, I think up to 300 people for the Stability and Renewal Programme for organisations. And again, that was um, very lively, um, very informative, I, I hope. Um, we certainly had good feedback from that. And as I say, I think that'll be a factor um, and a feature that we'll very much have to keep going for all of our um, programmes in future. Uh, we need to do more of that. Last thing to say is just um, all of our um, uh, platforms have doubled or tripled in terms of um, people accessing the website and, as I say, all of our social media platforms. Um, and we've introduced an external newsletter this year, which is very well subscribed. Um, it's, uh, it's been amazing. So our channels have developed and people have been very responsive to those. So hopefully those have been helpful and we will indeed keep the external newsletter um, going through next year. No, thank you very um, much. Oh, oh, sorry. I wonder if I, if I may, could I just very briefly add one other side, one thing from the process side, uh, just an answer to your, your, your question there. I think, um, you know, we have from the process side, uh, particularly on the individuals emergency response scheme, really, really endeavoured to make it a, a very simplified uh, application process, much uh, less demanding than we would have in our normal uh, support for the individual artist programme, for example, we have uh, really reduced the mandatory requirements and so on. And we've tried in conjunction with what Noreen has said with the information sessions to make it more accessible. And I suppose really from my point of view, from the process side, the, the, the uptake of the first round at over a thousand you know, recipients would suggest to me that it, it hasn't been um, something that a lot of people have found overly difficult. Some will inevitably stumble a bit uh, with some, but you know we've tried to kind of really reduce all of that and I think the uptake reflects that. Could I just ask then just finally Chair, um, is there any, has there been any consideration or work or are you planning to have a discussion through the Department of the Economy um, and perhaps with Invest NI? Uh, we know that the business info um, website, my goodness, has there been some hits on that this year but I'm just thinking while the, the funding will be listed there some of the support programs for businesses for self-employed people will overlap with with what you're doing at the moment because of the nature of the industry and the and the breadth and the footprint as roshin has talked about but i'm just wondering if there is any joined up thinking there about the access to business support that comes through the department of the economy and ni business info and invest ni um, because there's no point in reinventing the wheel if the wheel's already out there. Um, and I'm just thinking, is there some sort of cross-departmental or cross-working cross, cross working that can happen there to help those? Um, very, very important. They've kept me sane, to be honest, throughout this, this COVID um, period for all of those wonderful um, arts businesses. I need to say that you're, you know, again, we completely agree with what it is you're saying. Um, and I know our minister um, uh, will and um, the departments have been in touch one with the other. We also advertised um, the various business support pro programs um, that people might be eligible for on our website just to make them aware. And obviously we're all very concerned uh, about the possibility of potentially double funding. Um, uh, and, and so we all need to be very careful um, that we're not um, inadvertently um, either encouraging that or uh, allowing that to happen. 
And um, so what I would say is that we have some very large organisations that I referred to, um, Chair, earlier on um, in the live music entertainment industry and indeed large commercial cinema organisations who've made application to us. And we're obviously going to have to, um, you know, very carefully consider those applications because of the nature and size um, of, of their request to us and our ability to meet that. Um, but what I would say is I'd make a broader point about the, you know, the future of the live music industry and cinema is really not a matter simply for the Arts Council, I think, to address. I think it is a much wider issue for the executive, including the Department for the Economy, to help us to help them get through and be sustained into the future. And that would be my, my plea to the committee, is any help you can give us in ensuring that those decisions which we're being asked to make are really not uh, uh, appropriate, I think, I would have to say, for the Board of an Arts Council that doesn't normally deal with these applications. We will need further help uh, from right across the executive in, in order to ensure that we still have a live music entertainment industry and indeed um, a cinema, a commercial cinema in Northern Ireland. So um, I, I think that's going to be a very tough one ahead, given the, the scale of the, the millions of pounds that are needed for, for those areas alone, um, never mind the rest of the, 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 the footprint that we're being asked to sustain. And I think that comes back to, as we were talking about earlier, the social contribution and what arts brings. It's not just about projects, it's about the, the well-being. I know that the Carnegie Trust um, have been talking about embedding well-being into policies to ensure that we help, and that would certainly help with you guys. Thank you very much. Um, I know I've asked you a lot of questions there, but um, it is really appreciated the work that you're doing. Um, it can't have been easy for any of you. Um, and just all I can say is please get that money out the door to those guys as quickly as possible. Safely, of course, we don't want anybody having fraud. But um, no, thank you very much, um, Roisin, for you and all of your team. And happy Christmas. Thank you. OK, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. I have then got Robin and then I have Mark. So I'm going to Robin first. OK, thank you, Chair. And I thank the Arch Council for, for attending uh, today. Um, we all look forward to things returning to normal um, for all sections uh, of, of the arts. Uh, my question is really quite simple, uh, Chair. I wonder, could I refer the arts team to page, <clears throat> page four of your document? And that's page 83 of our document. And then to page five, page six, and page nine of, of your document. And at the bottom of each of the tables, as you've presented them, there is an explanation, slightly different, slightly different, uh, the footnote. Um, UK awardees whose address was outside of Northern Ireland have been excluded from the table is the footnote on page 4. On page 5, there's a slightly same issue but slightly different uh, UK awardees whose address was outside of Northern Ireland and one awardee whose postcode was not categorised by NISRA postcode data have been excluded from the table. Uh, and a similar uh, type of explanation uh, on page six. Recipients from the Republic of Ireland operate at all Ireland level, including portion of activity within Northern Ireland, or that directly benefit artists that live within uh, Northern Ireland. And on uh, page uh, nine, uh, a similar uh, as, as page six is similar. Can I just ask the question, why are they just a footnote rather than being included uh, within the report and the details of the awards uh, and purposes of the awards uh, not included within the report? Um. 
chair. I'm just struggling. I have so many papers on my desk, but I will try um, and answer that. There are tiny, tiny. Um, this uh, paper that you have has emanated from our research and policy team. That's the first thing to say. And um, the um, programs have related to um, those who uh, have been aimed at. Uh, people who've been resident in Northern Ireland. And, and as we know, um, in the course of the pandem pandemic, many people were caught perhaps living elsewhere and were unable to travel. So that might be one explanation, but that does not mean to say they, they were not from Northern Ireland. I will come back to the committee and I'm more than happy um, to um, answer the question um, uh, through our policy and research officer who produced this paper as to why precisely um, those footnotes are as they are. Um, Robin, if that would be helpful to you, you can follow up. Um, I wonder, could I just sort of uh, add one comment? I think the rationale, as I say, as Roshan has said, it was, present, it was put together by our colleagues in um, research, but I think the presentation was essentially to show on the table the local authority distribution, and so it was really just because that was the primary purpose, so that those very few that don't fit into that rationale have just been put as a footnote. Um, that's, I think, just it's a very simple explanation, really. There's no, no other particular science about it. If I, if I could just add as well, um, Robin, just on your question about benefit to Northern Ireland, um, you know, quite a doubt. In terms of individuals, as Roshan has said, um, you know, people may be regularly um, performing and contributing here, um, but currently maybe living in, in England or, or, or elsewhere. So they, you know, weren't excluded if they, but, you know, they still needed to have a primary address in, in Northern Ireland for the individuals program. In terms of arts organisations, you probably know that there are a number um, that we would jointly fund on an all island basis with our colleagues in the South. Um, for example, the Troon Guthrie Centre um, in Monaghan. Uh, which is caters for artists from the island and internationally. Um, and there are a number of others like Visual Arts Ireland, which has an all island remit and does very good work um, benefiting both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So there's a, there's a number um, and organisations that are based in the Republic we may be funding because of their um, essential services um, to the arts in the North. Uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy, Chair, to, to receive the information by you. Uh, to, but in, in, terms of, in terms of the explanation being that it's local authority, I mean, each of the projects that you've suggested there yeah. is pertinent to a local authority in Northern Ireland. But I'm content to receive the information via the Chair. Okay. All right. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm going to then move on to Mark. Mark Durkin. Can't hear you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Arts Council for uh, coming along and persi <laughs> persisting with the star leaf and giving us that uh, useful presentation and trying to answer some of the questions that, that we're asking them. Uh, one thing that this whole pandemic and, and the associated lockdown and restriction and hardship has shown us, I think, is, is the value of the arts, and we all see the value of, of arts to our lives. But we can't forget that it's other people's uh, livelihoods, and it's vitally important that we do everything we can to ensure that that the sector survives and then that it thrives uh, into the future. So it's very important that, that, that we do uh, get this right. And while I, I commend the, the efforts of the Arts Council who've been handed this to handle, and I don't for a, a second imagine it's easy, I, I wonder, given that the, this programme our fund that's opening today, I think it's fair enough to assume that it is going to be oversubscribed. As we've seen the demand on, on the webinars, all of them have been booked out. There have been a lot of people waiting a long time uh, for this. It's been announced a few times and now that the day has come that it's finally open. I was wondering, how are applications going to be assessed and grants awarded in, in the event that it is going to be? Uh, that they could highly it is highly probable that it will be oversubscribed. Will that be a competitive process? Was he 
who has been hit the worst, or, or, or what way are you going to do that? Um, I don't know if Paul wants to come in, but um, just to um, Mark, um, I would say in the guidance notes, um, we have prioritised those who have not received any funding to date. Um, we felt that, that was fair. It doesn't mean that others can't reapply if they've had support from us, but definitely we want to look at those who maybe applied before and were unsuccessful or applying for the first time, so haven't availed of either the Artists' Emergency Programme, the very small one that we ran right at the start, or IERP1. And we also put emphasis on those who have been unable to um, access any other um, government support schemes as well. So new to us, not previously funded by us through the emergency programmes, and maybe who have fallen through the cracks, um, you know, been, been unable to um, even get universal credit, um, of which there are many cases. Oh, yeah. so, They'll be first um, and they will be assessed and we will fund them until we de deplete the budget. Um, but if, if they don't deplete the budget, <coughs> we'll have a second list, so to speak, we'll go into those who maybe were funded previously, but maybe got a, a much smaller amount or indeed have ongoing need. Um, so we're trying to prioritise uh, new. Oh, thank you, but but say it comes down to, the, I mean, will be more, will there be greater weight attached to artists as opposed to those who whose livelihoods and businesses are entirely dependent on the sector and where, where that underdependence exists? So say, for example, a stage crews or, or sound engineers who wouldn't be classified as artists who are able to apply for this scheme, but say there are so many artists and then so many who, who work and ancillary uh, rules, will there be a differentiation there? No, it's the same criteria for everyone. Mm -hmm. And what we're asking them to tell us the impact of COVID on them this year, um, on their earnings and on their ability to stay within the creative sector. So we'll be looking at that regardless of whether um, they are an artist or a cameraman or a technician. Um, for example, and that was very much the case in the first round of IERP. Um, I think people, because traditionally, yes, we're an arts council and artists, our programmes have been for artists and we've been assessing quality. I think, as Roisin said in her opening remarks, we're not looking at quality. Um, we're not asking people. We do ask them for a reference just to confirm that they do indeed work in the creative sector. You know, and someone who can say, yes, um, I know this person, they are working within the creative sector, they are, you know, making a, making a contribution. Um, but no, we're not looking at artists first and foremost, or artistic quality of work. We're looking at um, the person's role in the creative sector and how this pandemic has hit them. Thank you. And then we had heard reports, or, or maybe it's fair to say complaints, about grants being payable only for people involved in active projects, yeah. which ex excluded or would exclude thousands of freelance workers and those that simply can't work <laughs> because of restrictions, so that despite the, the hardship that they're obviously uh, going through. I was wondering, was that criterion imposed by the department or by yourselves? No, I mean, just to say, Mark, if I, I could um, speak to say that really we were um, signalling to individuals whatever their skill or role or background was, um, that we, were, we simply wanted to buy their time. We didn't necessarily want them to produce anything, to produce a project, to have an output. We um, were saying we, we are interested in you and your time. So that could be time to reflect. It could be time to, you know, um, develop your skills. It could be time to um, think about another pathway, another career. It could be time to do anything. We weren't saying you have to produce something that has to be presented. Uh, far from it, as I said, that concept of buying time is always very critical, I think, for anybody who works in the creative sector because they do need time to reflect, time to think, time to perhaps upskill, whatever it is they wanted to do, all they had to do was tell us what it is they wanted to do. Thank, thank you. And uh, 
And I had had concern expressed to me, and, and you may have received correspondence from Derry City and Strabane District Council. If not, uh, you soon will, but it's around the major or large organisations. Uh, Grant, there had been concern expressed that, that, that there was an award made to four organisations, and I'm not in any way trying to de detract from uh, their importance or de deny their need, but it totaled £619,000. Uh, how, how was that? process when the organisations identified they were all Belfast based and, and that's the thing that's raised eyebrows and, and raised heckles certainly in, in my locale and, and I know in other areas of, of the north as well. Roisin would you like me to take that? Yes um, Lauren yeah. please. Yeah. Yes um, thank you Mark. Um, I mean, I think uh, as the committee will understand, really throughout the pandemic, we have been regularly gathering intelligence and as Roisin has said, through various surveys. Um, and in particular, um, from our 100 or so annually funded organisations, those who get the, the annual grants and who are really core to the arts infrastructure, um, uh, trying to help determine their needs and establish their financial position and their forecasts um, through this terrible year. Um, in July of this year, it became apparent that a number of our core organisations would require a much larger intervention than the 25k that we could offer under the organisation's um, emergency programme, of um, which we've had two rounds. Um, those, as I say, had savings of 25, and we know that the needs, the deficits alone, are far outstripping that and indeed reopening costs. So we were very concerned um, and we've been tic-tacking back with all of the organisations, keeping a running total as to what they were telling us their deficits were, but very particularly going back because at that stage in June, July, we were talking with some representatives from the sector, not, not the whole sector, but through the Arts Collaboration Network and the department, about a £500,000 balance that was sitting from the Creative Recovery Fund from that £5.5 million, and whether that would be best placed going into the Individuals Programme or into the Organisation's Emergency Programme. And through that forum and the, the knowledge that we had ourselves, um, there was a suggestion that that might be used to look at the needs of some of these larger organisations because, as I said, £25,000 wasn't going to begin to address um, their substantial needs in reopening. So we went back again to all 100 and we were able to identify at that stage six organisations. This is not a criticism of anybody who wasn't able to give us the information. Some organisations simply didn't know. They weren't able to say, look, we need X amount in... Uh, reopening costs to make our buildings safe and to make them viable and to buy some essential equipment, be that, you know, um, obviously hand sanitising, signage, uh, all of those factors to begin to bring staff back in a phased return from furlough because some people needed those back, um, whereas others didn't. Others were going to stay mothballed, to use that term, for a while longer. Yes, yeah, so, so, some will have made the decision to stay mothballed maybe in advance of this having come on stream. Would that be the case? Well, um, both in advance and then just you know simply saying, like, we don't know yet. It's too early for us to say about when we might be able to break, start bringing them back, why we might need them. Um, you know, for now, we're going to stay as is. Um, I think an example I could give you would be the Grand Opera House. Um, you know, uh, without divulging any any sensitivities, but it's undergoing a major refurbishment, and the opera that has all been set back, obviously, as a result of the pandemic. So the Opera House, you know, have said, like, no, we have no immediate needs. We we don't know, and there were others like that. So, um, of the six that were really standing out with significant reopening um, challenges, and at that time, some glimmer of hope for theatres reopening. An example there, the MAC, um, Art Gallery has been allowed to reopen. So what we did was, two others fell away um, and said, no, actually on reflection, you know, they wouldn't be ready to even start to try to get their venues ready. 
um, we put a business case to the department for the four that did have substantial needs, and that was approved um, just when we announced the, announced the funding. Um, the rationale as well, a couple of important things I think to say is that no organisation will be funded twice. I hope that does go without saying, but just that double funding. And also part of the rationale was to take the pressure off the other programmes, the OEP, and also the health and safety and capital programmes that we've had, because those organisations have already had um, you know, some funding. I'm not saying that even all of their needs have been addressed. And this was all in the context of before we knew anything about the Barna Consequentials and the Chancellor's um, rescue package for the cultural sector. So we were doing our best to try and stabilise some organisations where we had the intelligence at that time and hoping that the others would be <laughs> catered to some extent under OEP with up to 25 and knowing that we had some capital programmes coming on stream as well. So that's, um, I hope um, it was through a business case department for the balance, for a balance, which turned out to be slightly uh, more than that, and that was approved up to the 619. So, so the other or do you know the other organisations who weren't or didn't uh, any of this was because I suppose. I'm sorry, you're Mark, you're breaking. Mark, you've frozen on us a wee bit. Can you hear us, Mark? Mark, are you, you're frozen. Can you hear us? It must be. Okay, we'll just wait on Mark coming back in. Kelly had a supplementary, she could <laughs> ask anyway. Do you want to go ahead, Kelly? Yeah, um, it was just just thinking about what you're saying there about the, the larger organisations. Going back to the individuals, in round one of the individual's support that was, was provided, that grant, there were a number of people who obviously didn't get through on that, and they were turned down. If the same criteria is being used for this grant, surely the same people are going to be turned down again. Um, I'm just thinking that the, the communities, um, Department of Communities has amended the charities um, grant allocation because they recognise that some of the criteria was just, to be honest, it, it made charities nearly go bankrupt to the fact that they had to use their reserves. But I'm just thinking, has there been no review then of the second round of this individual funding that's been launched today to change the criteria so that those who cannot or didn't, weren't successful the last time, could be successful this time because they are not getting access to any other funds? Um, we, we have looked at the criteria um, carefully and, and we've made a few changes. Um, we've emphasised that DJs are eligible to apply, for example, because um, some of them seem to think because they weren't specifically named in quite a long list that did say it was indicative. Um, unfortunately, they didn't apply. Um, so we've been liaising a lot with the DJs and we've made that explicit. Um, in the first round, we also had bans, which you could apply for, um, you know, up to 5k. This time we've taken away the bans um, and you can apply for up to 5,000 with an additional award of up to two and a half for deaf disabled artists. Um, and then we prioritised, as, as I was saying, those who have not received funding. Um, and we've been very careful to say if you were unsuccessful, you know, that does not mean that you can't reapply. It's just in a competitive round, uh, you know, which where you've got oversubscription, we do have to rank them um, somehow. No, no, this was people uh, who were turned down, um, that they weren't even in the ranking. They were just told that their application um, wasn't being accepted. A lot of gigging musicians were turned down the first time. They were out. Could, okay. Yeah, so I'm just wondering... You want me to yeah. Do you want yes. me to come in there? Sorry. Um, yes, I suppose there's almost two elements to that. Um, there are those that are deemed ineligible, if you like. Yeah. They don't go forward for assessment because they haven't been able to fulfil the mandatory requirements of the process. So perhaps they haven't... Um, look, the, the, those that were rejected, a lot of them were because they hadn't... Uh, submitted a CV or they, uh, or they hadn't um, 
supplied us with a reference and perhaps they misunderstood that we needed a reference statement as opposed to just a reference uh, that we would follow up and we just wouldn't have had the capacity to do that. We've made it clear in all the, con all the correspondence to those people who did not get through that eligibility process, you know, what where, what they needed to do and that there would be a further round and they'd be welcome to come in and they should know now what that they need to submit there. And again, we've had the information sessions and we've had the guidance notes and FAQs up on the web for a period of time for people to really familiarise themselves. So I think we have tried to make efforts to say, look, just because you got rejected last, you were ineligible last time round, if you come back to us this time round with the CV uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a very extraordinarily presented CV. It can be quite a simple document, but it does have to be a document. Um, and your reference statement, then you will be considered. And then as, as Noreen has already said, um, you know, it, because you didn't, those that did go forward to assessment, they were eligible, if you like, but they just fell away because of the competitive nature of the programme. They're not at a disadvantage this time around. In fact, they will be prioritised um, because we will, we, because they haven't been received funding from one of the other programmes before. And what In about fact, the, the what number about, of... What about those people who were not turned down after assessment? What about the ones who couldn't even get in to be assessed? Will they be prioritised as well? So, in as much as they will be new to us, yes, and that they, you know, if they if they successfully submit and they haven't, they're saying in their application form that they haven't had any funding, then they will be in that priority list. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask that uh, Roshing and Mark Darkin come back into the spotlight again? We must have lost them at some stage. Yeah, they're guts. We've got. Thank you, Chair. Both back in. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead if you want to ask further questions. I, I don't know if it, if it, if that was just me or if so it was rushing as well. But you went to blank. So if you want to go back to where you started after um, the answer to your last question. Uh, I know it, it, it was just in terms of, of the funding that was available and in, or well, the funding that was ultimately awarded, did all our organisations outside of the four who ultimately were beneficiaries of this, uh, and I know there was, it went to six and then four, but did all our organisations out of that know that there was another pot of money there that they could have uh, accessed some of, that they could have availed, that, 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 that this could have helped them uh, throughout this? We went to them, we didn't want to raise expectations, um, Mark, because when it's a business case process, you know, um, there can always be um, a negative outcome. Um, so we, um, as I said, didn't want to raise expectations, but we're, we did go back to each applicant, each organisation who is a regularly funded client to say, can you identify your reopening costs and other um, costs at this stage that could be um, spent before the 31st of March. Now, it was a fast um, turnaround process, but they did all come back to us. And as I said, we've kept a, you know, a running total, not only of deficits, but reopening costs, which we have also presented to the department in a much larger document, um, you know, which really helped, I think, um, to underpin um, how we would be deploying some of the cultural recovery fund, the £33 million. Pounds. So it's not as if, you know, um, there was a special case just for four, um, although we did take the opportunity to avail of that £500,000, um, but very carefully did ask um, some organisations, and it's not in any way a criticism, um, we're just had to say, look, no, it's, it's too early, we can't identify those. So we took a pragmatic approach, but to assure that there's a, there was a much larger case uh, representing uh, all 100 regularly funded organisations and a wider footprint to the department, which um, was underpinning what we at least estimated. Um, and of course, the 33 million is not enough. Um, what we needed for the arts sector alone, because that's where we have intelligence. And then, of course, uh, you know, as you know, in Ocean is illustrated, we've got commercial independent cinema, we've got the commercial sector, we've got a lot of other people competing for that funding as well. Okay, and just, just one thing finally, you've said there that 33 million is, I don't know, often, I don't think you 
it has become increasingly apparent. However, it is a, a barn consequential, and uh, there's a, a formula by which uh, we got a lot of that, or 29 million of that anyway, uh, from London. Now, the chair referred earlier to the information we'd received in, in a briefing session prior uh, to, to this evidence session from yourselves that pointed to, to, to Scotland, for example, where there could be awards of, of much greater monetary uh, value than, than those here. How come the money we're getting, based on that Barnett formula, isn't or doesn't seem to be going as far as it does elsewhere? Have we, uh, I know we're, we're renowned uh, as a place of art and, and culture, have we more artists and organisations per head of population, or, or what's the story there? I mean, to say, obviously, everybody got their um, fair allocation of Barnard consequentials, uh, and you're quite right. Um, in Scotland, we explained <coughs> earlier, um, Mark, that um, there are normal programmes um, which are funded um, beyond our wildest dreams to a much greater extent. They do allow yes. um, individual artists to get up to £100,000 over a three-year period for professional development uh, and, and the creation of work. So those were not really the hardship funds that they were using for that. That was their routine um, exchequer grant that they got from the Scottish Parliament uh, in order to undertake that work. We only routinely give up to £5,000 and for a major award of which we have four or five in a good year, um, we give up to £15,000 to an individual um, artist. Um, so it's simply um, the lack of resources that we've been facing for many years now that have hampered our ability to um, meet uh, and to match what Scotland or Wales um, is able to do. Okay, no, that, that's fine. Thank you. Maybe just one final one for knowing that it's going back to the, the, the large organisations. Well, the, the, the process that took place, you know, in terms of uh, getting organisations to tell you the difficulty they were having or what costs they would incur by reopening them, did, did that engagement take place before or after uh, the announcement that theatres and museums and that could reopen? Um, it was it was July, so there were the um, green shoots for um, art galleries and theatres beginning to prepare, yes. And then of course, you know, with second second waves and you know, facing into the autumn, um, those um, you know, the, the guidelines have been continually changing, as you know. Yeah. But you know, as I said, there, there were no costs um, awarded to those four which, you know, have not been able to be deployed. And we've gone back and checked with them again, you know, because as Paul was describing, there's a detailed letter of offer then that would go out. Um, and we have been carefully monitoring that. And also, you know, they have been um, updating us on their expenditure against those awards. The Ulster Orchestra, as you probably know, was the only orchestra in the UK that was still operating um, and they had substantial needs going into the Waterfront Hall to do their programme, which has been terrific, of recording for Radio 3, um, as I said, the only orchestra and the, the only contract to do that, which has been a major um, opportunity for them. And the Lyric, the Lyric Theatre, I don't know if you can me, Mark? Oh, I can, I can. Now, my battery's low, my computer's going to die after all the difficulties we've already had. No, and just to say, I mean, the Lyric Theatre would be another example that has been doing, um, you know, a lot of, obviously, COVID-safe work, um, but, you know, been doing filming. They were involved in the Splendid Isolation Project with the BBC, which has been nominated for an award, um, you know, broadcast um, on, the, on the BBC network fantastic six shorts so you know that they, they have been able to continue to do some element of programming the mac did reopen um in the summer with a fantastic platform for the degree shows from the art college um and again you know although that was a small window i was down again on, on saturday actually because they've just reopened again and you know um seeing a building in use really as a, as a pilot 
um, you know, very, very well signed, all as you would expect the, um, uh, you know, software, both to monitor people coming in for their time slots, but the navigation through the building with that signage, with the hand sanitizers, with contactless payment, all of these things were factors for venues who were, you know, were ready to start thinking about that and, and been able to pilot it. So I would take that positively as, as learning yeah. for, for others. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and like I have to emphasize again that I'm not knocking those organizations whatsoever. I'm just conscious that I remember when the minister announced or the announcement was made that th theaters would be allowed to reopen. I think it came at the end of a week in which a couple of major organizations, I think of the, the Millennium Forum and my own uh, constituency, and I think a, a large a venue in Belfast too, had announced that they wouldn't be opening again this year. And it, it was only after that they had, had made those statements that the, state, that, that the decision was made to allow theaters to, to reopen. So I wondered, had it been done earlier, or you know, had anyone gone back to them and says, well, now you might be able to reopen if, if we can help you with the costs because at that time there was still uncertainty about the extension of furlough and, and, and all sorts of things and the landscape has been changing rapidly and, and, and regularly it's been very difficult for all those organisations and I don't underestimate for one second how difficult it's been for you either No absolutely and as I said you know we, we've been pragmatic as well as the, as the year has dictated particularly on that but to say that since then, the, the health and safety and the capital money for the department has been valuable. That's been over a million pounds. So hopefully those other organisations, and I know they have, have been able to come in and get their needs catered for. Not, you know, hopefully the majority of them at least. Um, and then through the stability and renewal programme, by that is the, the big footprint where um, all the rest, and as I said, no one will be double funded. So we'll be looking very carefully at awards already made. Um, that didn't look at deficit funding. Um, so, you know, and as Roshan has said, deficits are going to be the big priority for this programme to get organisations stable um, and ready for next year. But, okay. um, I yeah. No, thank you, Noreen. Thank you, Rashin. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Mark. I just want to give you just a little while longer because I have a few follow up questions from some of the stuff um, members have said. Um, the first one is around the, the programme that has opened today. Uh, Kelly had mentioned this about we have many people who have fallen through the net who have received absolutely nothing. Can I just ask then? When does that program close, and when are those people likely to see money in their bank accounts? So the program closes on the seventh of January, and um, we aim to get uh, money out the door, Paul. Um, you know, subject to all the usual um, uh, requirements in February. Okay. Okay, so but you will be working as quickly as possible to get that out because, um, I mean, we, 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 I know certainly I spoke on Radio Wall Street yesterday about the high levels of poverty and food poverty mm -hmm. and fuel poverty in Northern Ireland. And we know that many of these people that are going to be applying for that will fall in um, to that. So it's just that um, if, if that can be done uh, as speedily and as soon as possible, I know they would be appreciative. The second point then I want to bring up, I want to go back to the organisational or organisation funding programme um, that uh, we had. We had heard here in the committee from various individuals or various groups rather and businesses. We've got a letter today in our committee packs from the movie house um, who I, I had met with last week because they're based in North Belfast and they mentioned various things to me uh, to do with North Belfast but one of the things they did mention was about applying for this grant and the level of difficulty for someone who is a business that has never ever had to apply for any form of grant funding in their life before, um, to be faced with the, the grant application was completely daunting. And in their case, it actually cost them money um, for uh, assistance, whether that's from accountants or whoever else, to complete that grant. So people have been out of money in, in completing the grant. And we also heard from other smaller organisations that had just said, because of one or two questions in it, it ruled them out completely 
so they were unable to apply for that grant. And I know um, from speaking to the minister early on in this process, she had suggested um, at a time that they would be looking at at, at, a, at separate, maybe two separate types of grant on that organisational one. Yeah. Um, that would make it easier for those smaller groups, those more independent groups um, that don't have that don't have those form fillers sitting in, in a room somewhere that are able to do that for them. And we know from our briefing session that other jurisdictions have used a tiered approach when it came to organisational grants. Um, they've used two or three tiers. Um, why did we choose um, only one tier of, of a grant application uh, and material of what that size of that organisation was, the capacity of that organisation. Um, who made that decision? Was it yourself or was it the department? And why did you come to that decision? We capped our um, level of grant um, at half a million. And obviously that's partly a function of the resources that we have and we didn't know how many applications there would be to the programme, nor indeed their size and their scale and their nature. And what we did say, Chair, to organisations seek, please, please discuss your requirements um, with, um, with an officer so that we can talk you through and see you know, what your needs um, are. Um, so we did encourage people who were applying for significant resources to come uh, and speak to us. Obviously, we were um, uh, wanting to ensure that these were COVID deficits that people had incurred, rather than defi deficits perhaps from a struggling business maybe in the previous year, not as a result of, of, of COVID, but as a result of other various economic uh, and business factors. So we're, we're focused on the COVID deficits that have been incurred by organisations, not by the loss of income, but by the deficit, and we're very clear about that. And in order to ascertain um, the level of COVID deficit, we have asked organisations to provide us um, with the latest um, audited accounts. Now, for many organisations, that probably relates to the 1819 period. Not many organisations will close their accounts and have them audited uh, for 1920, so that that we understand um, is you know perhaps inevitable. But secondly, we're also asking them um, for um, management accounts and indeed um, cash flow and bank statements, and that is in order to identify whether or not those organisations have received funding from other government sources for the purposes to which they're applying to us. And obviously bank statements and, ca and cash flow will project where they might see themselves being at the 31st of, of March, 2021. And those are the metrics that we're using to assess the financial requirements of the organizations and, and how much we can in turn support them um, to stabilize themselves. Obviously, those requirements for large, you know, the larger organisations, um, you know, um, who haven't applied to us before, um, nonetheless, we would hope would understand that those are basic business requirements. Um, they would have that information, hopefully, um, and they can certainly hopefully secure that information in order to make application to this programme. But it really is necessary in order to avoid um, uh, double funding and uh, in order to demonstrate live need uh, and that's what we're focused on. Smaller organisations um, obviously there will be um, less, they're less complicated uh, and um, should still nonetheless be able to provide us with that level of, of, of um, uh, documentation. We are and we also have it complicated by the state aid um, aspect for the first time, we are asking organisations to um, say whether they believe their trading um, as an organisation um, is uh, in breach of state aid. Um, and that's a new requirement and that would be unfamiliar to many in the traditional art sector who've never been asked that question before in terms of unfair competition. And, and of course, it's um, 
further complicated by where we are in the negotiations um, around um, leaving the European Union and the Northern Ireland Protocol. But we have been talking to colleagues in the um, Department for the Economy who are working in that area just yesterday, in fact. Um, and we're also um, getting in uh, financial experts through the department who very kindly helped um, from Ernest and Young um, to help with the detailed financial assessments, particularly of those larger, more complicated organisations who might have group accounts. Um, you know, they may have different holding companies um, in order to get a handle on the precise requirements, because I think many people do confuse uh, and we've noticed this amongst our footprints. Many people confuse loss, loss of income as opposed to deficits. No, I mean, I absolutely get it and I understand. I mean, we have seen fraud. Um, this pandemic has brought out the best in people, but it's also brought out the very worst in people as well. But we have seen that in, uh, without many of our departments of, of, of grants and funding that has gone out. And it has, it has been fraudulent applications. Um, and that is yeah. absolutely the last thing on earth that we want to happen when we know that there are so many people and organisations out there in genuine need. And absolutely, mm -hmm. so I, I agree with the, those accounting issues. I absolutely agree with that. It just concerns me slightly that some, um, whether that's a small uh, production company, whatever that might be, whatever that company is or organisation is, um, looked at this application and felt, my goodness, how am I ever ever going to complete that. That is it, it's just laborious when we know in other jurisdictions um that, that that application process was done slightly differently. So it was just to highlight that that was all. It's it again I agree that accounting is extremely important and we shouldn't be double funding and we certainly shouldn't be um allowing for any fraudulent claims either. I get that. Um, so I suppose it will be interesting then, um, going forward then, whenever you have all of the final detail in that, and that's been done and dusted, um, for for uh, us then to be able to see the demographic of where some of that funding went to, um, you know, and absolutely we want to see, we absolutely wanted to see into those community community and voluntary groups out there as well that do wonderful work. Those, those other organisations that we all know of who do wonderful work. Everybody is entitled to this. Nobody is not entitled to it. Um, so that will be interesting to see. I have nothing further for all three of you. I just want to say a very big thank you. I know um, it would... I've just got a message here just to say, uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the na analysis? Um, uh, sorry, I can't read that. Oh, Noreen. Yeah, Noreen had mentioned uh, that included information from the 100 annually funded organisations that estimated reopening case. I've been asked if we can get a copy of that. Um, if you understood what I said there, Noreen. Yeah, I hope you did. Yeah. <laughs> that garbled message I just translated there. Um, so, look, and, uh, we really look forward to, to getting all of the information back just to see where that funding has gone. We know that you have been having to work under really high pressure circumstances to get those funding applications assessed and that money out there and for that we are absolutely grateful mm -hmm. um, and we're grateful to have you as an organisation steering the, steering and leading the way um, with the arts here in Northern Ireland and most definitely again as a committee I can give you that commitment that we will continue to champion and lobby on your behalf and those people that you represent um, uh, going forward in, in the, the months and years to come. Um, because we, we do realise the essential part that you play within Northern Ireland. So can I just say thank you and wish all three of you a, a very Merry Christmas and, uh, and take that time to rest and enjoy it. So thank you very much. Thank you. You've been very gracious and we really do appreciate the words um, of support and look forward to continued engagement with the committee and coming back um, to let you know how we fared um, as a result of all these um, additional programmes next year and share that information with you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. OK, members, we're going to move then on to agenda item number eight, which is a departmental, departmental briefing on the January monitoring round. Can I inform members you'll find this papers for this at page 90 of your pack? And can I welcome to the meeting then today Sherry Arnold and Gavin Patrick? 
Um, I think it's yourself, Sherry, we're going to go to first um, to give us your brief. It's, it's, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Cal, Gavin. Okay, no Thank problem. You, Chair. Gavin, go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, Chair and uh, members. Thank you for the opportunity for myself and my colleague, Cherry to brief you today on the Department's budget position, including COVID-19 funding, January monitoring and budget 21-22. We have provided a written briefing earlier in the week on these areas, and I will now give you a high-level summary of the budget position, then Cherry and I would be happy to answer any queries. As you will appreciate, this is an extremely challenging year to manage spend against budgets with so many unknowns driven by COVID-19. This is coupled with the fact that after the proposed January monitoring transactions, the department will have an increase of 29% on 235 million of resource funding and 11% or 23 million capital funding compared to the opening budget position. Um, I refer to Annex 1 in your uh, briefing pack uh, in relation to the department's COVID allocations. Since we last briefed, the, uh, the committee, the department has received 108 million for COVID-19. These allocations were for COVID-19 heating payment, councils, sports recovery, charities fund, emergency community support fund, food support, and the social enterprise support. The department's COVID allocations totaled 275.3 million. And as outlined in table one in your briefing pack, after a small number of easements and transfers, the budget post-January monitoring will be 264.9 million. We have also provided a summary position of all the COVID-19 funds as part of Annex 1. All of the bids put forward by the Department have now been met, and colleagues are working hard to ensure that the funding reaches those in need as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now referring to Annex 2 in the briefing pack in relation to January monitoring, this was commissioned by DOF on the 18th of November with the completion date of the 3rd of December for Stage 1 and the 4th of January for Stage 2. In completing January monitoring, we have sought to ensure the Department remains within strict financial tolerances, whilst ensuring that appropriate funding remains in place to meet business and welfare needs. As such, we have used this opportunity provided by the Executive to reposition the Department's budget in light of the ongoing uncertainty regarding COVID and its impact on the wider economy. In January monitoring, the Department is not submitting any further bids, either in resource or capital. The Department does propose reduced requirements for, to surrender to the Department of Finance. These include 11.4 million of ring-fenced resource, 10.5 million of capital, and 1.7 million of non-cash. Further details of the, on these reduced requirements are provided in Annex 2 of your briefing pack. The more material of these are in resource, £8 million in housing benefit rates uh, due to the difficulties Land Property Service had with forecasting their rate rebate scheme requirements in light of the current pandemic, £2 million in COVID-19 discretionary support grants, despite activity to increase uptake of COVID-19 discretionary support grants, including increasing awareness, increasing award amounts, and greater flexibility in the award period, uptake remains low. On capital, there's a 4.3 million easement within the Casement Park Stadium project. Um, the slippage is due to the prolongation of the planning process and realignment of contract costs. 3.6 million held for the cost of IT equipment for operational staff will now actually score as resource um, due to the accounting treatment uh, and that the individual laptops are now below the department's uh, capitalisation threshold. And there's a 2.6 million easement and additional housing association grant receipts. Unfortunately, budgeting rules only allow departments to retain the first 1 million of additional receipts. Any amounts above this can only be retained if they can be linked to spend. And the only areas of spend that can be linked in this case are the new build programme and the co-ownership scheme. And neither programmes have the capacity to use this additional spend this year. Given the current significant uncertainties presented by the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, the Department has taken the opportunity to update its AME forecast in the monitoring round. The Department's AME uh, position for Social Security benefits and other AME is a 0.7 billion increase from the year starting position. This increase includes a 0.2 billion uh, related to tax credits, 
0.4 billion related to additional universal credit claims due to COVID-19 and 0.1 billion related to changes in caseloads and awards. The breakdown of the Amy January monitoring forecast position is provided in Table 5. As I said at the start, this year is extremely challenging and all efforts are being made to ensure that our funding is being used appropriately and quickly while maintaining best value for money for public funds. We will be seeking to spend our full allocation in this financial year, the challenge of which, given the circumstances and the significant uplift in budget allocation of the 29% resource and 11% capital, shouldn't be underestimated. Now, referring to Annex 3 and your briefing pack in relation to the Budget 21-22 exercise, the future year exercise was originally intended to cover resource, um, resource budget for a three-year period, 21 to 24, with a further year for capital. It has since been... Oh, don't break down. We're having a difficulty here, year. Gavin. Sorry, Gavin, we're just you're breaking up a wee bit on us, just the last sort of 10 seconds there, that's all. I'll try again. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes, I can. Yeah. So, well, I, I'll go back to the start of the 21 22. Is that yep. where you lost yep. me? Yep. Did, did, yep. Okay. Um, so, the, the, the future year exercise was originally intended to cover resource for a three year period, 21 24, with a further year for capital. It has since been determined that it will be a one year spending review covering only the 21-22 financial year. Since we last briefed the committee, a number of changes have been made to our, uh, our department's return for the information gathering exercise. The bid for new welfare mitigations has been adjusted from 147 million to uh, 58 million. The bid for terminal illness has been adjusted from 153 million to 2 million. And the bid for offsetting two child limit on universal credit, housing benefit, and child tax credit has been adjusted from 57.5 to 29 million. These adjustments reflect, ref, reflect the time required to introduce new regulations, develop the schemes, and put payment mechanisms in place, which mean that a full year spend will not be possible during the 21 22 financial year. A recovery bid of 53 million for grants to local councils for lost income has now been brought forward by local government for 21-22. A COVID-19 recovery bid for a restart scheme of 12 million has now been included, and a COVID sports sustainability fund bid of 6.3 million has now also been included. Table six sets out the revised resource bid submitted by the department. I hope you find our brief impact for today informative, and Cherry and I are happy to take any questions in the department's COVID allocations, January monitoring, and uh, sorry, somebody tried to phone me on my computer at the same time. There. Uh, January monitoring and the budget 21-22 gather information gathering exercise. Okay, thank you, Gavin and uh, Cherry, for that. And Cherry, I think I say your name twenty different ways every time you're in front of me here in committee. So uh, apologies. <laughs> Apologies oh, for that. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I suppose um, what really is quite stark and what um, is quite, I suppose, shocking for us as a committee as well is the lack of bids um, that have been put in for the Jan January monitoring round. I mean, we know there's a, an overwhelming need within our, our communities. Um, can you shed any more light on then why uh, there hasn't been these put bids put in for January monitoring? I think in general, as I said, our, our COVID-19 bids have all been met. So when, when we put these bids forward in, uh, in, in part of the COVID exercises, and the latest one being in November, they were taking account of the remainder of the year. Um, so I think we're in a fortunate position that those bids have been met. Yeah, and, and I'm glad those bids have been met. Um, but there's more than than COVID and pressures in our in our communities and across all of the many facets of this department. Um, so you're saying there really was nothing else that would have required an extra bid to be put in. Well, again, we we all see as part of the the January monitoring process, we have discussed with colleagues and and, and look at uh, all spend areas. Um, Obviously, with COVID and the additional funding, again, as I've mentioned this year, a significant amount of extra funding the department has received. Um, there's obviously as well the capacity to be able to deliver and, and get that money out. And it will be a challenge um, to deliver on the COVID 
bid that we have met, and that is a significant amount of money. Yeah, and I'm just I'm then going to look. Then I'm going to move on to table two, and um, the the surrendering then of money in that table two. You said there yeah. about the discretionary support grants and that two thousand um, pound that will be returning on that. I think I'm correct in saying that. Um, just again, I, I absolutely it it does. I, I just don't understand how that is the case. Um, do we? We know that. People are very, very many, many people have had become new on the universal credit, are applying for the very first time, and others that can apply for discretionary support um, because they're allowed to apply for that so many times throughout the year as well. Um, just as to why that position is, I had, I would have expected actually that we would have been coming back looking for more money um, for discretionary support and not surrendering that. Um, can you just shed a little bit more light as on the why that has been the case, if you know why that's been the case? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, discretionary support COVID grant is actually a non-repayable discretionary support grant for those self-isolating or where a member of their immediate family is required to self-isolate in line with the guidance by the Public Health Authority. Between the 1st of April and the 30th of November, the Department has issued approximately 15,000 COVID grants. To the end of November, spend is sitting at 2.1 million. We're holding almost a further million to the end of the financial year. However, despite work that we've done to increase awareness, and that's through NI Direct, the Department's own websites, social media, and the advice sector, and also to working with Department Health, also, two steps that have been taken to increase the award amounts. So we've increased the award amount to the universal credit rate that rather than the income support rate, which is allowing an extra £20 per week or £40 per fortnight to be issued. And also steps that we've taken to look at the award period. The uptake on the scheme actually still remains low. Um, uh, so as a result of this, the department is it's actually surrendering £2 million pounds of a reduced requirement in the January monitoring round. Because despite the steps that we have taken as a department, we are not seeing the increased demand for the scheme through in our forecast to the end of the financial year. Yeah, and, and sorry, but I, I had read it as discretionary support, and I'm now saying it is COVID nineteen discretionary yeah. support. Um, so apologies for that. Um, just want to say that uh, for uh, being so shocked. But I I do absolutely get that because whenever you do speak to people, and I know certainly in our constituency offices. Whenever we are taking calls from people around benefits, around hardship, around <coughs> various things that they're having to face at this stage, there still is, a, you know, a great unawareness of this COVID-19 discretionary support grant. And I know um, that was one of the reasons why the minister did bring that back to the chamber quite recently was just to highlight the issue again that it was available. Um, so it, it is, uh, yeah, we, we would have hoped that it would have actually been more spent on the issue of the COVID-19 homelessness then. The reduced requirements, what's the, sorry, what was the reason again for that? Uh, uh, just to add the following scrutiny by the Housing Executive that confirmed the, the reduced requirement, the specific contingencies linked to accommodation and support options not being required at the, the level initially estimated. Obviously, when the bid was put in, it was, it was back in springtime and it was high level estimates. So, we, again, we have, we have challenged in all of these to ensure that. Everything that can be done is being done, and that's the residual amount that housing executive have flagged. Yeah, because again, I find that another strange one because we have had um, witness briefings here over the last months um, from from homeless uh, homelessness providers um, through supporting people grants. Of course, a lot of that money as well, and just how much they were finding the difficulty in providing the support that they wanted to provide. Um, with, within the homelessness um, sector. So again, that's just another one that kind of jumps out at me as being quite strange. Um, I'm going to open up the meeting here. I've got Kelly and then I've got Alex and then I've got Mark. Thank you very much, Chair. Folks, can I just take you back to the discretionary support, um, the COVID discretionary support? Um, you've said there that, what was it, how many, 15, was it 15,000 or 1,500 had been issued? <laughs> 15,000 15, um, grants have issued, COVID grants. Okay. I suppose it, it's, it's worth me saying as well to you, in addition to that, we've put out 36,000 um, normal discretionary support grants and loans over the period, which are totaling in the region of 9.7 billion. Okay. Can I um, ask... Funding that we're holding... Sorry? Can I ask how many were refused? 
because I have almost every second phone call that I get is for people who I've told to go and apply for the discretion, the COVID discretionary support grant that are coming back and saying that they've been refused. Um, how many have been refused? I don't have details on that, but Could I'm happy to follow up. Could you? That would be brilliant. Um, because my concern is that the loans are still being offered first and the methods that have been used to advertise this, while the department seems to be slapping itself in the back, there has been a dearth of um, access to information um, for people who live in rural areas or who have pathetic broadband. So social media and website all you want, it doesn't make a difference to uh, a 59 year old man or woman who's sitting in a rural area who doesn't have a computer in the house because they're up against it and can't afford broadband. So. Um, I just, I have concerns that the amount that are being turned down, so if we could get that, that would be brilliant. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about then is the money that's being handed back is one thing, um, but the bids, as the chair had said, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Where's job start? There's not one penny has been bid for here for job start. Um, it's due to start any day now, and the department had mentioned before you know, that this job start scheme um, was going to... Um, you know, come from internal funds. If there's money being given back, where's the money for job start? So the department bid for the funding for the labour market interventions in the October monitoring round. That funding was um, not successful. That bid for funding was not successful in October monitoring. As a result of that, the department has carved out money internally um, as a result of easements and um, largely from salaries to fund that scheme in the end of the financial year. So why wasn't um, it bid for again? I'm just wondering because we were told there was going to be an over 50s, which is mentioned here about the, the, the older age group. And again, there is not money mentioned here for either of those schemes. You would have thought that that, given the fact that this was money that was um, Barnet consequential, um, and the department had to, in October, look to its uh, internally to, to fund it. Why wasn't there another bid put forward for it now? Because it's still not there. It's still not out. Um, yeah, the, the proposed launch of the schemes has been delayed. Um, the money that the department is holding at the minute, we believe, will be sufficient to cover the requirements to the end of the financial year. Um, in terms of restart, we have bid for funding for the 21-22 financial year and for the other four labour market interventions. So there's a bid in of 24.7 million for those okay. um, from 1st of April. And again, part of the reason for the reduced requirements for the scheme this year has also been to the extension of the job retention scheme or the furlough scheme until um, the end of March, um, which has reduced demand for those schemes in the current year. Can I just then go to Appendix 3? Um, this may well be information that you'll need to go away and, and, and bring back for the committee. I'm extremely concerned by what I'm reading here um, of the 21-22 updates to previous return, which is on it's Annex 3 in our pack, it's 106, or page 106. So bid number 22 for the new welfare mitigations has been adjusted downwards. Um, if this is for 21-22, that's, pre uh, that's predetermining what the review of welfare, the new welfare mitigations will be. Um, and it's the same with the terminal illness. That's predetermining a decision on terminal illness um, and the offsetting the two-child limit. And to be honest, do you see if this is because the department cannot put forward legislation to bring this forward? That's, I find that unacceptable because this was a new decade new approach these are all things that we all had agreed to politically to bring forward um, and I appreciate that while some of the reductions in the previous figures that we talked about was for this financial year this is actually reductions for a future financial year when decisions and clarification on those matters have not yet been taken, presented to this committee, discussed or consulted upon. So I'm just really concerned. Could, is there some way that we could find out what's going on? There's also um, on part number four there, the COVID recovery grants to councils. Um, if we're looking forward to, now it mentions there about 2021, um, the updates to the previous return, there was a report that was given to the Committee for the Economy on an update of the impact of Brexit to councils, and councils themselves have said that they're up against it. 
but there's no bids in this for 21 or no mention of the 21-22 update based on that report findings coming out. If there's anything that you could give us perhaps on um, what's being considered for 21-22 to support councils, not just for COVID, but obviously the other issues that they're going to have bring, uh, uh, be brought forward as an outcome of Brexit. Um, but I'm just, if you can give us the reasons why that money has fallen, you may not have it to hand now, but if somebody could give us the reasons why that money bids are being reduced when those decisions haven't been taken yet, that would be really, yeah. really useful to know. So in terms of the new mitigation, it, it reflected everything that the Northern Ireland Human Rights Re Commission recommended. Um, some of the schemes will require new primary legislation mm -hmm. and the time frame period for that is estimated to be in the region of 9 to 12 months. Um, those schemes require new primary legislation, include increasing the carriage allowance, the Best Start grant and additional people, disabled people in low income households. Um, as a result of that, and until we have confirmation on their funding from 21-22, we obviously can't progress. There, there will be a full review of mitigations planned that has not yet commenced. But that's, that's part of the reason why the new mitigations bit has been reduced. In terms of the special rules for terminal illness, um, the department's bid for the £153 million was based on a previous cost and produced by the Scottish Government. That cost in itself was um, subject to a significant number of assumptions and was very heavily caveated when returned to the Department of Finance. And that was because further complex modelling work was required to be done by the Department to determine the actual and likely impact here. As a result, the revised figure of £2 million is based on changing the current six-month criteria to 12 months and reflects um, a requirement for six months in 21-22, given that again further primary legislation will be required and that's likely to take between nine to 12 months to complete. Um, for future years, we've also notified Department of Finance of the requirement for four million for a third financial year. And then again, just um, in terms of the two child policy, Again, the department's bid for 58 million, again, was fully in line with what was proposed by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. And it was suggested that that would mitigate two child policy for 17,000 households within Northern Ireland. Again, too, given the lead time required for new legislation, and also too, to develop the payment mechanisms required to deliver that those payments, it's anticipated the scheme could only be available from September 2021. As a result of that, the department's bid again has been reduced to reflect a six-month requirement next year as opposed to a requirement for a third financial year. Okay, well, it sounds to me very much like that it is all delays caused by legislation whenever, to be honest, January of this year, like we're talking 12 months ago, um, it was well known that these things would be needed. Now, the terminal illness one, I am really hoping that Department of Work and Pensions catches itself on and the Treasury actually resolves the six-month rules. So the terminal illness, I'm hoping that we don't have to bring that in as a Northern Ireland mitigation, that um, Westminster will deal with that um, themselves. But I am really not happy about this crack about the new welfare mitigation so that if we agree this within the Assembly, there's still going to be this delay. Um, the Minister has brought through a number of pieces of legislation very quickly um, without us having full um, scrutiny to remove money out of next year's budget and to say that I'm, I'm flabbergasted to hear that the new welfare mitigations hasn't yet been started to be looked at given the fact that as committee we have been asking for months to be honest to, to see this. Um, it's not as if everybody in the countryside isn't um, working, you know, people are working from home, it still means they can deliver upon those mitigations. Um, so I think we'll, as a committee, need to go to back to the um, department just to ask what's going on here. Um, how long, uh, we're seeing this paper now, um, how long is it before those figures, that reduction for 21-22 um, will be signed off within the Department of Finance or within the Communities and Department of Finance? Because I think as a committee, I would want to hold back on reducing those amounts until 
we can find out what's happening with the welfare mitigations. And to be honest, we are sitting with um, many of the advice sector, can tell everybody, people who joined Universal Credit in March time are coming to the end of that discretionary period and the loop, or, you know, that, that gap uh, means that there's an awful lot of families now are going to be hit by the benefit cap, um, the two, two child limit and so on now, um, and are going to be in poverty for the rest of this year. Uh, because we haven't got mitigations in place for them. So I would be very reluctant, Chair, in reduce and accepting a report that's reducing um, potential money for communities for next year when we don't know what the outcomes are. And I know it, it talks about the Human Rights Commission, but I think even the Human Rights Commission would be aghast if legislation forced people into po or the lack of legislation forces people into poverty. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. There's a lot of information there. I know it's not necessarily a new guy's remit, but um, we need to, as a committee, just to, to work through this. Okay. Can I, just before I bring in Alex and then Mark, um, go ask you again, um, Cherry, you had mentioned there the 36,000 people um, were successful in receiving. Was that the discretionary grant and not the discretionary loan? Uh, it was a, it was a mixture. So, um, yes, there was an addition to the 15,000 that received our COVID grant, there was 36,000 that re received our normal grants and loans. Um, there was 11,000 grants issued, that totaled £6 million. Um, and again, too, there was loans issued, um, 22,000 loans issued for £3.7 million. And again, too, as well as universal credit contingency. Yeah, and I mean, that's what I was going to ask then about contingency fund. Is that a separate amount then on top of that? Separate amounts of three thousand issued um, for just under um, 0.9 million. Okay. No, I mean that that is something the committee also will be wanting to look at coming into the new year, and we'll maybe get the letters off before that. Um, just to ask about the breakdown of that again, because I know the minister had most well, certainly, uh, and I know she believes as well that um, you know contingency fund and discretionary support should be the default positions when it comes to anybody new applying for universal credit. We know there's been an increase in that and I would like to think that that is the case and that people are not being given this horrendous advance payment that puts yeah. them in debt from the very first position. So we'll probably be asking about the advance payment then, part of that as well. Uh, is that, and I know you'll not possibly have that information there at hand. Um, uh, I just want then to move on to Alex and then Mark. Alex? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, the first one is just a bit of an observation. Um, the amount of money being handed back is quite staggering. <laughs> and I, can, I understand the capital bit. I maybe don't understand the other bit, um, especially with housing benefit and stuff. So just with what's going on, how, how is that happening? Because we would have thought the way things are that would have been fully utilised. Is, is there a reason for this, or are things maybe not as bad in that sector as, as we thought with housing benefits and uh, stuff like that? And do you want me to give you a second uh, bit, or do you want to do that first? Well, I can answer that one quickly, and then if that's okay, just to, the housing benefits um, have, were forecast at the beginning of the year, um, and um, LPS and um, who, who managed the, the rates rebate and obviously um, made assumptions around how how the need was going to develop as the year went on. Um, however, the need hasn't been there just as they anticipated, hence the, the £8 million uh, uh, reduced requirement. Otherwise, that, that £8 million, £8 million would have been going to line property services. It isn't for DFC to spend. We transfer that to LPS, so we're handing that back to DOF. The rating grant is it's obviously a lesser amount, um, but again, it was based on an initial forecast, which we held, and now is is no longer needed. So, the, in short, the need is being met, okay. um, and we're giving up the, the excess rather than holding on to it because the, um, they're ring fenced and we can't use them for anything else. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Um, about money's coming in, um, COVID nineteen heating payment. I'm not sure if you can answer me this. Um, would you be able to give me an, uh, an idea about the criteria? Because I know those who are getting pension credit, DLA and PIP, are going to be able to qualify for that. Um, but what I'm curious to know is the £200, is that going to be per person or is it per household? Or what way is that working? And will people who've got the winter fuel payment, 
here are not in those three categories still get it as well? You know, those who are just on ordinary pensions. And, you, know, got, um, you know, they've got the pensioners' age and they get it anyway. So is, is there some people, what, what's the criteria exactly? Or, or is there anyone been missed out? So there, um, so obviously, yes, you're correct. The department has bid for and received 44.3 million to make a one-off heat payment of 200 pound to specific groups. Um, it's not a household payment. Okay. So um, it will go to anyone who's in one of those eligible groups. It's those that are on the higher rates of disability level allowance, enhanced rates of personal independence payments, higher rates of attendance allowance, and people in state pension credit. Um, can I just clarify uh, um, that, Chair? Um, can I just make sure it is a household payment? Because previously the Minister had said that she felt that if, say, for instance, there was a pensioner with, on pension credit in the household and they got the £200 and perhaps they lived with someone else, son, daughter, whoever, um, who was in the higher rate of PIP, that there would only be one payment made to the pensioner and not to the person with the higher rate PIP. Um, or is that not the case then that both of those people in the same household will get the two hundred will get two hundred pounds each? Um, I, actually, I am aware colleagues this morning are coming from the department who will be um, will be better placed to brief in terms of the eligibility Thank criteria you. than myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have an SL one on this yes. coming up. You're quite right, yeah. um, okay. Chair. We have an SL one that we have to agree so we can ask the finer details on that. Sorry, Alex. Sorry, good word. It's individual based. It's supposed to be individual yeah. in this, yeah. Well, yeah, sure that's, what, that's what I understand, um, um, but they, they should be able to clarify. Okay, well, I'll let you off lightly then. <laughs> okay. Wait for the Thanks. Lady. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Happy Christmas. <laughs> no. Okay, Mark, Mark Durkin. There we go. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, folks, uh, for the, the presentation and, and the answers. He, he's across a lot. He could have used the officials are coming later line a lot, a lot earlier. Uh, and a, a lot less to, to say and a bit of a lighter grilling. Uh, most of the points I was going to make have been made. I certainly share uh, Kelly's feelings or indeed frustrations around uh, the, the mitigations piece and the money being handed back. This is something that I have and we have as a committee, in fairness, been writing to the minister or the ministers uh, on since since January for, for almost a year now. And it, it's, it's what I feared and it seems to be what's what's going to happen. In terms of the money, like we're, we're saying it won't be able to spend any mitigations because they won't have been legislated for. Would there potentially be scope, and this might be a question for someone else, but to put in the legislation that the mitigations could be applied retrospectively uh, to the start of the financial year, in which case we may not, or the department may not, have to surrender this money now? Um, I would have to refer that to legislative colleagues. The department isn't surrendering money for 21-22 now. Um, obviously, that's for the next financial year. That's our bid of what we think that we could fully spend on that next yes. year. I suppose uh, in terms of mitigation, like we have handed back, we did hand back £3 million in the October monitoring round. The reason for that was actually largely due to the pause and the NHE rent increase. And again, too, because there had been more successful claims for, for um, benefits, and that the benefit was PIP. Um, where people are successful to PIP, they actually get it funded then from Treasury, and it's not funded from Northern Ireland Bloc. Um, in terms of our existing mitigations, we, we are progressing plans um, to amend those. The proposed amendments would ensure that anybody affected by the bedroom tax would receive free mitigation. Again, too, it also considers individuals that are, uh, in, are obviously eligible for benefit cap and would ensure that their full loss is mitigated. Um, legislative amendments obviously are required to change the existing schemes. Um, and colleagues in the department obviously are working at the minute on the time frame for that. Um, so hopefully that explains why there's been an, e an, an easement this year. For I'm next year, it's only what we, what we would be bidding for. No, sorry for my, my misuse of terminology then. We're not surrendering it. We're just saying we, we won't need it uh, or as much, uh, essentially. But, but I would like to maybe get that clarification uh, on, on the legislation and the scope to do something retrospectively. 
because the people are suffering already and people are going to suffer even more uh, due to the, the, I suppose, lackadaisical approach that has been taken to, to legislating on this extremely important uh, issue. In terms of the discussion of support thing, there's been a bit of back and forth and I think I'm more confused now than, than I was. Sorry, Mark. What? <laughs> What is the difference between the traditional, the classic discretionary support payment and the, the COVID one? Well, what's the difference in terms of amount, the terms, and in terms of eligibility, and in terms of application process? Um, uh, there's a, there's online forms have been developed, and there's a, it's, it can also be telephony as well too. Um, in terms of eligibility, the COVID grant is for those that are have been asked to self isolate. Um, and that would be the key difference between the two schemes. They're both aimed at anyone who's in hardship. Yeah, but, but they both have the same criteria, I, I think, in terms of household income. And things yes, like household that. income. Yeah. It's, it's £20,405. Yeah, and I know that's, the, an, that's an increase on what it had been. But in my view, that's still nowhere near enough. And I think that's reflected in the fact that there's a £2 million underspend here. Most households with even one adult working and households with two adults not working will have a household income greater than £20,400 and we, like, we, we didn't have or don't have a self-isolation grant similar or, or the same as other jurisdictions our criteria here was a lot more prohibitive in my view and again that, that seems to be borne out by the fact that at a time when there's never been more uh, families, more individuals, more households in need that we haven't been able to get out <laughs> this money to help them. Yeah. So the GB scheme that was put in place from September to the end of January, our own scheme will be in place for the full financial year. So as Minister Hargy put that in place in March this year. Um, that's for the, obviously the, the self-isolating or the COVID grant scheme. Um, in terms of our scheme, in some ways it is more favourable than the scheme that's in place in GB. Um, it's not linked to any kind of self-enforcement or sorry, self-isolation. It's a non-taxable payment. The GB scheme um, is taxable. Um, again, it, it, we, the view of the scheme is that it targets those are in need. So it is those that are below the income threshold of 20405 there's no limit on the. There's no. Sorry. 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 Did you say it's not linked to any self isolation? No, there's no. Um, it, there's no requirement. Um, there's no enforcement of self isolation related to it. Okay, but I mean the whole concept of a self isolation payment is that someone will be isolating and yeah. be suffering financially as a, a, a as a result uh, yeah. of that. Yeah, so obviously locally we haven't put any kind of enforcement of self-isolation in place. It kind of seems to me that it's a discretionary support payment with a COVID sticker on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can get it more than once, yeah. Um, you can, yes, you can. Yeah, there's no, you can. Limit. There's, there's no limit on the, the number of payments that can be made. Um, and again, too, the amount can actually exceed £500. Um, oh, but I'd say it could exceed £500. I, I, I doubt it has exceeded £500 too many times. I'm sorry for blaming you, Chair, Chair on this. I'm not blaming, blaming you. But uh, I, I, I think there's, you know, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm just a bit confused by, by, by that. Right, and, and I'm sure that the public will be too, but, but I mean, it is shameful that whenever we have a situation where people have been put in a position where they have to choose between following government guidelines, staying at home uh, to protect themselves, their family, their, their friends and their colleagues are actually going out and working in low paid em employment, but still above the £20,400 threshold that, that, that comes into to, to their household that people have been faced with that choice because they haven't been able to access uh, a self-isolation grant a la the one in uh, England, the one in Scotland and the, the one in Wales. So I have heard it from the Minister that it's a favourable scheme in comparison to that in other jurisdictions, but I'm not really buying it. Okay. And just one more thing. Jack, sorry, and this, this will be. Okay. 
Um, the paper refers to overtime that staff have been doing uh, in, in delivering benefits, and sadly, we, there's a high. Well, I think it's it's inevitable that we're going to see a significant increase in uh, the number of claimants, and I know there's an ongoing re re recruitment process to address that. But has there been any reassessment of, of the bid for additional staff needed to ensure claimants get their applications processed in a timely manner? And I know in the earlier paper that we had had seen uh, look, to, looked at the cost of, of this recruitment of bringing on the new staff, and, and seemed to be that there'd be no capital cost associated with that because we had the room already in government buildings, or there'd be no need for, for, for new premises, new software or anything like that uh, for these employees. I wonder had there been any development on that? So obviously we continue to for forecast and obviously look at our forecasts. Um, because of the extension of the furlough scheme until the end of March, we're actually expecting when the numbers of unemployed increases to have been pushed out slightly. Um, uh, despite this, the department has is still retaining its bid for the 900 additional staff next year. Um, I, I think, as I briefed last time, it's a significant challenge to bring in 900 new staff when you've got social distancing measures in, play in, in place um, to accommodate them, equip them with the IT and obviously put training in place. Um, however, at this point in time, we would actually need significantly more than that number. So we use quite robust Forecast, forecasting methodology. It's in line with uh, Treasury methodology, so we have a, a complement and system in place that determines our staff numbers. So um, we have uh, obviously alerted DOF to the fact that um, the 900 staff may not be sufficient and that we would propose to bid in year if additional staff are required, but we are continually keeping that position under review. Okay, no, thank you very much, Jay. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, just before I bring Andy in, just want to draw a member's attention. Kelly had mentioned the Job Start programme there earlier. Sean has now sent yeah. an email through. Um, apparently, we got an email again late yesterday to tell us that that scheme has been postponed yet again, or paused rather, um, at, at the last minute. It was due to start on Monday, from what I can gather. This is now yeah. Thursday. Um, I think they would have known on Monday that they couldn't start it, if not Friday that they couldn't start it. So it's a bit disappointing yet again. We received something at the very last minute yesterday about such an important scheme that we've been waiting on for so long um, when they would have known on Monday and it could have been in our papers and in our tabled papers for our, our knowledge. But we were told um, very much last minute before we go into a four-week break of this committee. So I think that's, that's just, just wanted to put that on the record. That's extremely disappointing um, uh, to hear that news. Um, and I'm sorry to break in on, on that. And I'm going to go to uh, Andy and then Mark, if you've commented sorry, that outcome. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry, excuse me, Pierre. No, a, a, a guy just arrived to fix the, the, the boiler in the office. So, so I missed what the email was about. If you could just... I will indeed. Entry. It's an email we received from the department with reference to the job start scheme that was due to commence on Monday yeah. past. Um, we were, the committee received a letter through again late yesterday um, to say that this has now been paused due to uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. My point is... They would have known this on Monday that it had been paused and should have got the letter to us for it to be included in our um, uh, in our packs, but they didn't. It no. came late yesterday, so therefore okay, no. they they know the protocol of the committee and they know that if something comes in late or uh, later on a on a, a Wednesday, it's not in our packs to the following week. And for us, the following week is uh, middle of January, so it's just to, to to flag that up. That was all. Okay, Mark. no. no. Share your view on that. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, Andy. Can I bring no, you in? No charge. Okay. And if, if I might, just on that point, I, I'm somewhat annoyed because the minister, when she was with us previously, indicated that she'd paused the job start scheme yep. from being op open uh, during the two-week lockdown period. So that would be an indication that it was ready to go. Yep. Uh, and when the officials were in, they indicated that it would be open for, on Monday for expressions of interest from employers to start that process. And which is going to knock it to the right uh, in respect to that. So deep, deeply upset. In, and in it knocks it even further, Andy, because we're going into the Christmas period where employers will be closed as well, many Absolutely. of them. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. 
No, uh, Chair, uh, in relation to the uh, the budget stuff, it's just more a general observation rather than a question. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions in relation to the COVID-19 discretionary supports fund. And I don't know if colleagues around the table uh, and on authority for the same. I'm still getting constituents indicating to me that they're having trouble getting through on the telephony yep. line. Yep. And also constituents are indicating that they're being directed to the online form. Yep. And many of those constituents are having difficulty from being able to complete that online form. So I'm concerned that um, maybe not intensely, but there are people who are not availing of this much needed um, support package because the support is not there for them to apply for it over the phone in that respect. And, and I would ask that the department review that because I am still getting this. I have uh, got this information from constituents uh, right the way throughout the, the COVID period. And I think that might be part of the problem why there's not as much of an uptake as what they would like. Any comment on that? Um, I, can, I can bring back lines to committee on that. Yeah, I, I know it's been an issue that has been flagged up in the committee in the, in the past and flagged up by other, not just committee members, but other witness, witnesses as well, about the difficulties for many people um, when it comes to these online applications. Yeah. Um, so, and I mean, and that goes back to that point I'd made earlier about safeguarding and vulnerability of people applying for benefits. Um, you know, there's no safeguarding, well, there doesn't appear to be very good safeguarding um, uh, procedures in place for those people that are more vulnerable. Um, any other comment anybody wants to make on this at this stage? Everybody, I'm not saying everybody happy because <laughs> that would be a good bit far. Um, but can I just then say thank you to yourself, Gavin, and to Cherry. Thank you so much for coming in and briefing us. And uh, can I wish you both a, a, a peaceful and quiet Christmas? Happy okay, Christmas. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Thank you. Bye-bye. Christmas, Christmas to yourself. <clears throat> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye. Okay, members. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, uh, anything we want to... Okay. We don't really have a great deal of control over this when it comes to bids and all of that sort of stuff. We can certainly um, notify our, our, our uh, unhappiness at some of the the issues that we have brought up here, we can certainly do that through to the Minister and to the Department. Um, I think, Chair, I would like to know how many people are being turned that on the discretion, the COVID discretionary fund grant um, and the ordinary one and the, what do you call the other one? It begins with C. The contingency no. fund, we asked for that fund. last week, the breakdown. But we definitely need to see how many people are being spoken to about this. How many are being awarded and how many are being refused? Because I can't uh, and, believe that. And how much should they be awarded, Kelly? Yeah. They did mention figures today, and that's why they were saying they were keeping a hold of a million pounds to run through to the end of this financial year, but it meant an underspend of two million that they were given back. I, I just can't understand how, if it's the first thing that people are being offered, why there's an underspend. I would like to know how much debt has been has happened over the COVID period because of the, the loans. But um, I think what we've got in front of us is the turn, the, this money being reduced down that's been asked for for next year. I, I just think that presumes something that we're not, as a committee, being given access to. I agree. Mark, do you want to come in? I, to, to just in terms of with Kelly asking about the success or, or failure rate of, of, of applications, now I'd got a, a question answered there, there during during the week, but now I'm having difficulty working out if it's the discretionary support grant or this COVID one, which genuinely and more made the point there. I'm sorry for I got a bit frustrated with Jay because she's just peddling the lines. There is no discernible difference. Only someone will cite the reason it has been. Uh, COVID, but there seemed to be about it. I've done it per constituency, so I don't have a bottom line, but just looking at each constituency, it seems to be about a 70% success rate okay. in terms of applications. And there's also the issue around discretionary support grant and discretionary support loan. Yes. So there is, they had said that that figure included both. Um, so I, I think we need. I think following on from this, we want that information for coming back in January. Um, just in in uh, in the last uh, in the last year, just how many people, uh, and we need them to break it down into into actual uh, the the different types of grant. 
So we do, and and a ward would be helpful as well, especially for the the, the ordinary discretionary support grant and the ordinary discretionary support um, loan, and also the contingency fund, and also how many people actually were offered um, advanced payments as the default. Um, I think that's all. All of those questions need to be asked, and I think that's uh, our another thing. We will we'll ask those. And if members have any more questions on that, certainly we can get back to the clerks on it. But I'd like that sent off so we have that for coming back in January. Andy, did you want to make comments? Yeah, sure. Just, just, I'm just referring back to the five-year strategy document that we got last week in relation to that. Mm -hmm. And on that, it's stating that the average award for the COVID grant was £139. Uh, so, so in relation to that. But also, I think if I recall rightly, just in the previous presentation, there's an indication of 3,000 applications for the contingency fund. Um, but on that five-year strategy document, it indicated there was 49,000 um, 126 advanced payments approved um, since COVID-19. So th that, that breakdown is very important because I'm fearful that, especially in relation to universal credit, the predominant amount of people are getting the advanced payment rather than mm -hmm. the contingency mm -hmm. fund and it's being underutilised. And I know that was something actually the minister, uh, both ministers that we have had were very much against that that advanced payment was going to be used. Um, so we need those, we need some answers on that, definitely. Members, is there anything else following that briefing? Any further questions other than maybe stuff that was brought up? Kelly? I was just going to say, can we ask for clarification exactly what the progress is in the welfare <coughs> mitigation? Okay, um, yeah. Because um, I, I thought that we were led to believe in the background that the department was working on this. Um, and it was that's why the committee had been asking so often to see what was going on. Um, if we're now hearing that no work is happening on it and the legislation isn't being, you know, that knocks everything so far back. I appreciate the department's under an awful lot of pressure, but we need to know what's going on here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay, members. Um, then if we can just move on then from that, happy enough, we'll move on to agenda item nine, which is a departmental briefing on the definition of affordable housing. Members, this was a briefing that was requested by the department, and we made the effort to create space in our agenda for this before Christmas. However, no papers were received no, on this item in time for proper committee consideration before the meeting. Therefore, I took the decision to cancel this briefing and reschedule um, for the new year. Any comments on that? Are members happy enough that I, I went ahead and did that? Right decision, yeah. Chair. No papers. Okay. Can't do it. Yeah. No, we can't. Um, agenda item 10, then, we've already covered. And just before I move on to agenda item 11, um, can I just uh, just ask members to take their ease for a few moments while we prepare for that? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, we'll move on then to agenda item 11, which is the SL1, the COVID-19 Heating Payment Scheme Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this SL1 at page 145 of your pack. This scheme is being introduced to provide financial support to ensure that additional heating costs incurred as a result of the pandemic will not create an added burden or anxiety. Through the scheme, the department will make a one-off payment of £200 to people in receipt of pension credit, as well as those receiving the highest rates of attendance allowance, personal independent payment and disability living allowance, and that includes children. And, and I know certainly Andy has brought this up, as have many members this morning, including Alex and um, Kelly and Mark. So it's all been talked about this morning. So can I welcome to the meeting Anne McCleary, Mickey Kelly and Brenda Henderson. If we could have Anne, Mickey and Brenda brought into the spotlight, please. There we go. They're all Hello. there. So they are. These are all very welcome. We, we, can, we, can see your, we can see your beautiful face today, Anne. We've only got you on audio. But well, I'm, well my, computer has, my computer has just decided to do an update literally a minute ago. And uh, so I'm relying on the phone. But I'll try and get back in uh, as soon as I can. But anyway, I'm on the phone in any event. Um, thank you, Chair, for giving us this opportunity to come and talk to you about this scheme. I'll begin by introducing my colleagues, Brenda Henderson, who's the Director of Child Maintenance Service and Make the Call Wraparound, and for the purposes of today, is also the Policy Lead on the COVID-19 Heating Payment Scheme. 
and then Mickey Kelly, who I know is well known to you all. Very but, well known. Uh, very, yes, well very well known. Very well known indeed. Yes, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know Mickey. The infamous Mickey Kelly. The infamous, the infamous <laughs> Mickey Kelly, except he's not an Australian bandit. Um, <laughs> but Mickey, Mickey, as you well know, is the director of pensions, disability, benefits, security, and debt. So uh, they are on the call as well. I don't know if you can see them. But oh, they yes, are also we can. here. We can, we can see their wonderful can, faces, right. well, yes. Hopefully you'll be able to see me shortly. Perhaps once I finish this brief introduction, I'll be able to get back in again. But anyway, um, I'll begin by clarifying that while you are all more than familiar with me talking to you about Social Security benefit regulations and policies, on this occasion, the payments in question are not Social Security benefits. Now, that might seem like a bit of pedantry on my part, but trust me, it is relevant to it. They are not Social Security benefits. I'll begin by giving you a quick outline of the context before uh, then the team will deal with any questions that you have. Um, the COVID-19 heating payment scheme is part of the department's response to COVID-19 pandemic. I stress it is an emergency response and therefore it was keen from the outset to find a quick and meaningful way of providing financial support to those who are most in need. In this case, it's identified that older people and those with underlying health conditions are more at risk from COVID-19 and are therefore likely to be affected health-wise if they're unable to adequately heat their homes. Now, obviously, this is more of an issue during the winter months. The focus has therefore been on those cohorts and the scheme specifically identifies the target groups as those who are in receipt of the higher rates of our disability benefits, that is DLA, PIP and attendance allowance, as well as those older people who are in receipt of state pension credit. Now, this has been the subject of an executive meeting and it was approved at the executive meeting on the 3rd of December. But if I can just end my introduction by stressing the key factors to remember are that the target groups are those on the higher rates of the known disability benefits and those pensioners who are less well off and that this is an emergency situation with a one-off payment. In order to get the target group's financial support during this key period, in other words, the winter, the policy has had to be simple and easy to administer. So that is the concept. And uh, we're now happy to take questions. And if you don't mind, I'll let my other two colleagues deal with the questions while I try to get in online. Oh, okay. Grant, thank you very much, right. Anne. Um, I'm going to go to thank Alex. You. I'm going to go to Alex and then Andy. So Alex, go ahead first because you had questions earlier. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, can you just cl clarify? Although we think we know the answer. That if there's two or three people in the house who maybe all have, maybe one has pension credit, one has full PIP, and one has full attendance allowance, will all three of them get a separate two hundred pound payment for that individual house? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So happy to come in in that one, and, and thank you for the question. That is the case, actually. It is paid to individuals, and, and the reason being that the greater the number of people living in a property, the higher the overall energy usage. So in most cases, heating um, provides for both space heating and for hot water. So the heating costs will be impacted by the number of people in a property and the behaviour of those people. And actually, what we have done in this is that we followed the, the Scottish model in terms of the, the child winter um, heating payment is paid to individual children, regardless of the number of children are entitled to the, the eligibility criteria in a household. Um, and just one quick thing, none of these people will be affected if they've had the winter fuel payment already? Yeah, so this pay anyway. Yeah, no, this uh, payment is in addition to any other payments, including the winter fuel payment. They're really there to address different um, issues at different times. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Yeah, so, so I have a couple of points. Before I move to my, my main point that I have, um, can you just clarify, those who are in receipt of mitigations um, due to uh, a, a award not being made, they won't receive this because technically they're not in, uh, having an award of PIP. 
if they have mitigations, they're not classed as having an, an award. Sorry, I can. It's just breaking up slightly, but I'm, I'm picking up most of it. So this is about mitigations, Mickey. So yeah, is yeah. Anne there to address that? Yeah. No, I know. You know, Andy, just to clarify, somebody in somebody receiving a mitigation payment has probably been disallowed on reassessed from, from DLA to PIP. So at the particular point of the qualifying benefit, they're not actually in receipt of any of the qualifying benefits. Yeah. So a mitigation payment wouldn't actually be an entitlement into the into the scheme. That that's what I thought. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the other point, and Mickey, you'll be aware, I, I had a conversation with you yesterday in, in relation to this. Um, so in relation to the war pension uh, mobility supplement payment, so the eligibility criteria as outlined in the SL1 here, it's uh, an individual who is in receipt of the enhanced rate uh, car component of PIP or the mobility component, and also the Hold either... On, we, we'll we we tech folks. Um, there's terrible feedback. I don't know who it's. It's either coming from Mickey and Mark or Brenda. So, oh, oh hold no. on. Let me just wait a wee moment. Um, sorry. Okay. Who what, was it? You speaking there, Mickey, or was it Andy? Mm. Sorry, Andy. I think I interrupted you. Andy, go ahead. You're okay. So uh, I was just saying there. Um, the eligibility criteria is outlined in the SL uh, states it's either component, enhanced component of PIP or either component of DLA, the high rate. Um, so I have a, a, a question in respect of somebody who's in receipt of the War Pension Mobility Supplement, which is directly comparable with uh, an individual, individual being on either the enhanced or high rate of either uh, PIP or DLA. Um, it is my understanding from um, engagement with the department that these individuals will not be included in this scheme and, and I have deep concern as there is a sizable number of individuals who will be in receipt of the war pension mobility uh, supplement uh, but will not be in receipt of other elements of those uh, eligibility criteria so they will miss out on this scheme in, in that respect. Yeah. Um, do you, is there, do you want to pick that up on at a high level first of all? And we can't really hear you for some reason. Okay, right, I'll oh, go here. back to I'll go, I'm Anne, back. Sorry, I'm back Anne, on the phone. And no, hold on. Sorry, I have got the Hold on, I'm I have got ask, the thing up on the screen, but it's Stop talking a minute, Anne. <laughs> I've, got, I've got I've got you coming in on your other format as well. So your computer is now on I've been brought into the spotlight. So do you want to try talk uh, I can see you now. Use your computer yeah. and turn your phone oh, off. You. <laughs> Love you. Okay. Um, yes. I mean, as I said at the outset, the main issue here is that we had to do a scheme that was in an emergency situation, and it needed to be simple. The 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 schemes or the payments which Andy is describing are not the same. They're not they're not the same as DLA, PIP, and attendance allowance. I know they may seem similar, but they are not the same, and we're not comparing like with like. The focus on this new scheme is people who are at the higher end of the disability continuum, and um, that was the simplest way of doing it. Yep. There are also other problems which Mickey can explain in relation to the practicalities, but... Um, at the minute, we are in a position where DLA, PIP, AA and state pension credit are the, um, the benefits which give eligibility. And you have to have been in receipt of one or other of the, those ben benefits at the relevant level on the particular date. And therefore, uh, Andy's quite right, the people that he's speaking of, um, those schemes are not included in it. But some of them may well also have an entitlement to um, DLA PIP in relation to the living component. And if they were at the high rate of the living component, they would be eligible and they will get. And, and, and with great respect, that's not my point, Anne. And, and, and I, disagree. Right. I disagree with the point that you made okay. in respect of it not being the same. So... The argument I would make is, and I'm aware of individuals, for example, before uh, transitioning on to the War Pension Mobility Supplement, may have been in receipt of PIP 
at the enhanced rate of mobility yes. and that you cannot be in receipt of both as their classes overlapping uh, benefits therefore by virtue of being in receipt of the war pension mobility supplement which is directly comparable from all the information that i have looked at to being in receipt of the mobility supplement or the, the mobility element either uh, enhanced rate or high rate on their dla it is directly comparable you can get the mobility car etc uh, etc et so i believe those in receipt of the war pension mobility supplement and i i accept it's nuanced are being disadvantaged here yeah. mickey you have been dealing with this can you you know, I, mean, I think it's that um, Andy's point is, 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 is well made, if you know what I mean, in terms of I think the point you made is, and is that um, they aren't directly comparable, although they do they do allow some passporting, as you say, Andy, to the mobility scheme, even cares allowance and some other benefits in terms of those things. I think the, the key point in all this scheme is that the key point of the regulation is the person has to be in receipt of the prescribed benefits at during the qualifying week, which was set down. There'll be other people that will fall into those circumstances in addition to the one you mentioned earlier, Andy, medication. There'll be people in hospital, there'll be people in prisons, there'll be other people in care homes who are not receipt of the benefit in that particular week, who, you know, who we have what we call a payment suspension on their benefit. And, you know, and the reason we do that is for administrative convenience. And that probably is the same thing that happens to somebody who was on PIP and moves to the War Pension Mobility Scheme. There's a payment suspension put on it, and it's there for administrative convenience. So in case anything happens, we just reinstate the benefit. But similar to all those other sort of categories, prisons, care homes, they wouldn't be in receipt of the prescribed benefit in the qualifying week, much as I take your point that it, 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 it's not directly comparable. And while there may be comparisons, it's not one of the listed benefits. Yeah. And that, that, you know what I, mean? I know what you're saying, Mickey, and I'm not going to fall out with you over this. Um, I, I would dispute what you're saying. I believe yeah. this is a direct disadvantage for those yeah. who are in receipt of the War Pension Mobility Supplement, and I would strongly yeah. encourage the department to review this. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we look at the SL1 in respect of, of the, um, the element, um, can I ask, um, just let me find it here, sorry. Um, I had highlighted it. Just bear with me, sorry. Uh, you know, whenever you're looking for something, you can oh, never no. find it. It's always the same. Yeah. You're all right. So, in terms of the quality impact assessment was carried out on this, uh, it states uh, that the, the department concluded that the proposals were not anticipated to have a significant implication for a quality of opportunity. Can you can you go into more detail on that? Uh, it, were not anticipate, anticipated to have a significant implication. So obviously there, there is a, an implication. What, what, what are the implications? Because I would contend that this is one of them. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to pick that up in terms of, yeah, we did obviously consider the Section 75 makeup um, of the group and 88% of those who met the eligibility criteria have a disability compared with 21% in the population as a whole. So um, it was seen then that the, the EQIA in, in the main actually did not adversely discriminate against people. I suppose the point on this, and, and I absolutely take your point, is that there are always bright lines when, when we are doing um, these type of schemes. And I suppose that the, this scheme, which we can administer and get payments out quickly to people, will bring within scope around 221,000 people, those with you know, the, the, the highest um, disabilities, the greater disabilities, and children uh, and pensioners. So. Um, Whilst I accept your point, it was really about trying to get a scheme that encompassed as many people who we felt were in those groups, you know, of greatest impact of the COVID, of cold, because we know ventilation is really important in suppressing the, the spread of the virus. So it was really looking at who could we bring, where were the greatest numbers that we could bring within the scope of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, just, I just want to add, if you mean, and I know it's not necessarily as a, a policy type point, but just to point out on a practical issue, if you mean, the department doesn't hold the data on the people who are in receipt of war pension, mobility supplement, or even armed forces independence payment. That's that's held by Veterans UK, if you know what I mean, because we don't actually administer the data and we don't actually have data in our systems of how many people on the reasons they're actually not getting paid for. We just know how many, and, and there's some coding information that tells us about people in hospital, but it doesn't break it down any further. So all I'm saying is it starts to have practical impacts on the date we plan to make. It could have practical impacts on the plans to make payments. That's not to say 
that's not a reason for doing it, but I just think I should share that. Yep. So, so can I ask the question then, Mickey? Um, so we, we say we've got an individual A who is in receipt of War Pension Mobility yeah. Supplement, and they yeah. then apply for PIP, uh, unbeknown to them, um, because, yeah. uh, as you're well aware, the benefit system is very complex. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, does the, yeah. how does the department identify that the individual then is in receipt of War Pension Mobility Supplement, and an award is not duplicated then? Yeah, it, it relies on the person declaring that to Los You know what I mean? We don't do any data matching with the, the Veterans UK agency. Okay, so no, uh, just just back to the key thrust of the point, and you know yeah. the, the the policy intent behind this in terms of the people that it's designed to capture. I would argue and contend very very strongly that by excluding this sizable group of people, that uh, this is disadvantaging them because individuals who are in receipt of the war uh, pension mobility supplement are identified as having uh, mobility needs to the same extent as their counterparts in receipt of the high rate DLA or the enhanced rate of PIP on their mobility. So I would strongly, strongly encourage the department to go back, review this and come up with a solution as to how individuals in receipt of the War Pension Mobility Supplement can avail of this and are not disadvantaged by virtue of their service. Here, here. Um, can I just then add to that, Andy? I think, and I'll ask all committee members that are present here today, but I would certainly be happy as a committee also that we forward that um, through to the Minister uh, as well. And I understand the reasons why Mickey said there about not holding the data because there's security sensitive data there as well. And that's, that's absolutely right that you shouldn't hold that data. But I'm sure that that data could be uh, made available. And you know, I, I worked in hospital social work for many, many years. I met many people coming in and out of hospital stays. Some of them one week, some of them twenty weeks. And r when I when rarely, and we couldn't report people who were in hospital and receiving benefits because that's not the job of, of the social worker to do. But rarely did anybody ever declare that they were in hospital and they went on. So you're going to have many people, I know you've said there about the, the, there's a qualifying week, rarely does anybody ever admit to having a stay in hospital to um, PIP or DLA. Um, sure. they're, they're, they rarely do it. So you're going to have people, that's not going to work on yeah. that level. I'm um, sorry, you want to come yeah, back so, with sorry, I just want or, to Sorry, back. Andy, Andy, sorry. I just want to very quickly come back and say, you know, I perhaps should have declared an interest as a veteran myself, but what I would, would add is I'm not in receipt of the award pension mobility supplement myself, um, but, I, you know, it's, a, it's an area that I have uh, expertise in and experience, so, yeah. No, absolutely. <coughs> Mickey, did you want to come back and say something there, no, or did no, I pick no, you no, up wrong? No, 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 no. I think I think perhaps what I would like to say is that I take all that Andy has said, and I do appreciate that there there probably are. In fact, I'm sure there are veterans out there who, had they been in receipt of PIP, would have benefited from from this scheme. Um, but as, as Brenda has said, unfortunately, we have to have bright lines. We have to have certainty. And if we don't get this money out as quickly as possible, people will not get the benefit of it. They'll not be able to use it for the purpose for which it was intended. Um, certainly, we go back and we're going to write to Minister, and uh, and I'm sure she will respond on that. Um, but it is, it is important that we get this done as quickly as possible for everybody's sakes. Yeah, and it's important to clarify, I'm not arguing against the, the yeah. policy principle of what you're trying to achieve here. Yeah, what I'm arg arguing is there's quite clearly uh, an equality impact issue here that a sizable section of our community in Northern Ireland will potentially be excluded from being able to avail of this heating payment. And, yeah. and it, it, it goes further than that because those individuals directly have the same difficulties from a mobility perspective as their counterparts yeah. that were in receipt of the high rate DLA mobility or personal independence payment. And further to that, I am actually aware of individuals before transitioning onto the war pension mobility supplement that would have been in receipt of the enhanced rate of mobility or DLA uh, in, in that respect. Okay. It's, it's one of those things, Andy, that unfortunately isn't as easy as it might as you might hope, mm -hmm. but certainly we will look at it, but it's not easy. No, I don't accept it's not, it's, mm -hmm. if everything was easy, it would be such an easy life, but you know, yes. that's, that's for us as elected representatives and the department to come up with the solutions to ensure that no one in society is disadvantaged, and, and I believe that this, this is quite clearly a disadvantage to that section of our mm -hmm. community. 
Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Andy Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you know what? I, I accept that there has to be these bright lines, and I would like to see that, that the payments go out for those that it can be awarded to now. But what I would be like, and what I would like to see, is a decision taken that if the information can be found on anyone who's in the war disablement pension or disablement supplements, uh, that the retrospective that they're not excluded if it takes a bit of time to do this. Um, so that would be the thing that would be maybe adding into the minister is to say go ahead with the scheme as it currently stands, but. Can we please have a retrospective payment for all of the people that they're then subsequently identified? But what I would just ask for clarification on, there are other government departments that recognise war disablement pensions and disablement supplements for other things that are not in the benefit system, for example, bus passes. Um, so if that can happen there, why can we not do this now? This is our Northern Ireland COVID payment. It's got nothing to do with DWP. It's up to us how we spend our money. So we can take the decision to include war disablement pension holders and disablement supplements. We've done it for Blue Badge. We've done it for bus passes. So why are we not doing it now? And I think that's what I would like to make very clear to the minister. And my final question is, because I want to make sure that I'm 100% certain, because 101 people are due to phone me this afternoon about this. When it references this payment of £200, does the person have to be on both parts of PIP to edit no, or just one? No, they don't. No. Good stuff. Thank you. No, yeah, just one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that was easy. That yeah, was easy. Was. Mark, have you any question or comment you want to make? No, I'm fine, Chair. I think other members have, have asked anything I, I would be inclined to. Dead on. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you, um, Anne, Mickey and Brenda. That was um, that was a, a good briefing and it certainly has cleared up a few points for us because we know it's, it's our offices that get all of these phone calls that come through and it's us as, as members of this committee that other members of our parties come to <laughs> um, for clarification on these issues. So can I thank you um, for, for uh, your briefing today and good to see you all and can I just wish you all in a, a, a happy and peaceful Christmas. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, members, we're going to then move further on then. So we've done agenda item 12, isn't that correct? Oh, just before I finish that item there, just maybe just for clarification. So we are going to write through to the minister, and I think actually yes. Kelly made that good point. And there's other, other departments within this assembly are able to uh, award various um, things to people within uh, with the war pensions um, stuff then why is it not happening and absolutely this is a best poke scheme for Northern Ireland that we designed so therefore we can design it whatever yeah. way we like we're not following any rules along that from yeah. coming can from I just, Chair it's just to make it very clear you see the bus passes right so somebody gets a bus pass if there's a whole list of people who can get bus passes and it includes people you know who are not allowed to drive because they're registered blind so you go through that, do you know what happens in the process? It goes into the Department of Infrastructure. The Department of Infrastructure get it ratified by communities. So if the information is provided through that way and can be ratified, why can't this be ratified? I just don't get it. Um, yeah, there, there's a way around this. And as long as the minister enables what needs to go on ahead to get paid now and then sorts it out, but it's, it doesn't exclude people on a retrospective basis, you know. Okay. No, I agree. Yep. Oh, everybody happy enough then that we proceed with that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Sorry. thank you, Andy, for bringing can that just, no attention. Sorry, go ahead. Can I just confirm, um, are you content with the department to make the rule with some sort of retrospective? Like yes. I don't yeah, we don't want it to be stopped. This yeah. needs to go ahead. Go we ahead understand and that, and that's not what you were saying either, yeah, Andy. Yeah. That's certainly not... Just getting that Yeah, we need it. Yeah. So we've agreed then to, to yeah. proceed with this, albeit we want to send that further it's later on, asking for that... The Sorry, point that ahead. I would have, Chair, is just, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to try to prevent the, the SL or the SR from yeah. going forward in that respect, but if the Department don't act in this, I, I think, you know, we as a committee have to consider our approach to that, because, uh, you know, and I accept what, the, or what the, the officials are saying there, but it is directly comparable because you can get the same entitlements under the war pension scheme, yeah. so there, there is a fundamental issue. Yeah. That, that will have to be progressed. So if the department don't resolve it, well, we'll have to. I would ask that we come back to this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and I would imagine we will re receive some sort of response by the time we come back to our first meeting in January. Uh, and if not, certainly we'll be chasing that up. But I think certainly with you on this committee, Andy, this is not going to <laughs> not going to be laid to rest. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks, sure. 
All right, members, we'll move on. So we've done agenda item 12, isn't that correct, everybody? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yes. we'll move on then to agenda item 13, which is SR 2020-318, the Pensions Protection Fund State Aid Amendment EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. You'll find a copy of this at page 155 of your meeting pack. Then can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No. No objections from nobody? Okay, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-318, the Pension Protection Fund State Aid Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item 14, which is correspondence. Members, you'll find the correspondence memo at page 165 of your meet meeting pack. I have nothing that I need to highlight. Um, can I ask then any members, is there anything on the correspondence memo you want to highlight? Are you happy to, as, as drafted? Go ahead, Kelly. Um, I was going to go uh, just refer us to um, something that comes up in Peter Corey's. It's page 206 of our pack. Um, Peter mentions there, this is an ongoing issue that we'll all be aware of. It's the categorisation of dance throughout all of the um, COVID restrictions. So I'm a former Irish dancer myself, so I'll declare that. It's been a while now, but um, the, Peter's actually saying there something different to what Irish dancing, for instance, would say. So Irish dancers want to be deemed as sports, and then Peter said, no, we don't want that to happen because not all dance would be, um, what is the descriptor within the COVID stuff, um, non-aerobic or stuff that doesn't get you out of breath, basically. So I don't know if we need to write to, back to the department just to ask for clarification of how dance is going to be treated going forward because it does cause a lot of confusion within that sector um, of how they should be treated within the executive's considerations I've, for COVID. I've also had several emails from constituents who run da dance classes within my own area. And uh, I mean, the, the issues that they're having, and they're very keen to get back to that. And some of them are on a one to one basis, um, some of them are in groups. And I absolutely understand also the issue around physical activity, especially for young people as well, and that there hasn't been any great guidance given on that. So, um, yeah, I think you're right that we ask for further information on that. Thanks. Uh, Just on that particular point again, I I'd had a question answered on that. Uh, you're very lucky, Mark, because my questions are I'm waiting weeks on answers, so you're good. No, will you, will you be waiting on them? And then sometimes you don't see them coming in, because they have a strange habit of coming in at half six on Friday evenings and things okay. like that. So, no, well, this one, let me see. I can advise that dance as an activity is recognised by Sport NI with the recognition. So some dance is sport and some isn't, but the recognised disciplines identify the sport are ballroom, highland, Scottish country and folk dancing. Wow. But not Irish dancing. Okay. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. And not even not even break dancing, which is now now an Olympic <laughs> sport. <laughs> Telling you, you won a few awards, Mark, for your break dancing over the years. Yeah, well, I've broken a few things while I've danced, but I haven't been great at break dancing. Well. Okay, well, then I think we just as then as a committee require some further clarification on that. Um, as to yeah, it, it's all extremely confusing. It's confusing for actually all of those teachers and classes out there. Um, if we find it confusing on the information we have, it must be much worse for them. So, yeah, we'll get more clarification on that. Kelly, you want to come back? Yeah, there's another one. Um, it's the Human Rights um, in Northern Ireland, that report, page 330 of our pack. There's a list of things that they have identified for communities to do with adequate standard of living and social security. I'm just wondering if we could write to the department um, to ask them for an update on those recommendations or requirements. Okay, yep, certainly do that. Yep, anything else on correspondence memo, folks? Nope, I'll then, uh, as, or, well, not as drafted, as suggested then through committee members, happy then with the correspondence memo? Yes? Yep. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to agenda item five then, which is the, or sorry, 15, five, <laughs> take us back a while. <laughs> agenda item 15 is the forward work programme. Um, can I just then inform members at the meeting on the 14th of January 2021, we will be briefed by Hospitality Ulster on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. We'll also, for the same bill, have an NI Hotels Federation. And also, as well, we're going to have in the Public Health Agency. So that's three briefings on the bill. 
and then we're also going to have members of the deaf community on the video replay system um, though in saying that it may be postponed due to a number of procurement and technical difficulties that the committee has is dealing with this and i think that just goes as proof of yep. the system that we have in northern ireland is not fit for purpose that we need a proper B VRS VRS. system in place in order for committees even to be able to take a briefing. It's absolutely ridiculous the hoops that this committee is having to jump through um, in order to make this happen. Um, so I, I, I dearly hope, and I know the committee team have worked really hard on this, I do hope that that is successful as we go ahead. Any comments on those issues that I've brought up? Nope, happy enough to move on. We'll then go to agenda item 16, which is AOB. Any other business members? Nope. No other business? Yeah, press release. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's an, yeah. Thanks There's been a much. press release has been sent around members. Um, was that the well, Robin's suggestion earlier? Yeah. Not right. Yeah, I haven't looked at it yet because I haven't had a chance with chair in the meeting. It's a bit difficult. So, members, if you can have a look at that press release and then get back via email um, to uh, I've already the, the Oliver the after the meeting and uh, whether or not you're happy for that to go ahead. Okay, any other business? I don't think anybody did have anything that they wanted to bring up at this stage. Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item 17, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Can I advise then our next meeting will take place on Thursday the 14th of January 2021 at 9.15 and that will be here in room 29. Can I thank everybody for their um, attention today and for this this last part of the, uh, the the mandate and wish them all a very Merry Christmas and I look forward to seeing you all in January when we'll be back with no doubt a whole catalogue of other issues that we have to deal with. <laughs> so thank you very much. I would say to members, can they stay on the line because we've just an issue of communication um, to have a chat about after this meeting. So I'll then declare the meeting officially closed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.